Welcome to the planning board meeting of February 17th, 2021. I'm Bonnie Sontag, the chair of the board, and I will begin with a roll call of members. Alden Clark. Here. Beth DeLeal. Here. Sorry, here. And, thank you. Ann Gardner. Would everyone please unmute yourselves, Ann Gardner. I'm sorry, here. Thank you. Tanya Hartford. She doesn't seem to be here yet. Uh, Leah McGavern. Here. Rick Tainter. Here. MJ Verde. Here. Don Walters is absent. Bonnie Sontag, I'm here. Linda Guthrie, our note taker from the planning office, Andy Port and Caitlin Sullivan. And I'll go through the agenda. Um, under public here, we have general business, um, not a public hearing. Um, 177 State Street, a minor site plan review. We have one public hearing for the Institution for Savings at 93 State Street, site plan review, ITIF special permit, and DOD special permit. Other business, Evergreen Common so Subdivision, a request for a release of security. There's one uh, piece of correspondence, approval of minutes, any updates on potential zoning amendments and other updates from the chair or the planning director. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everybody that materials relating to each of the applications we'll be reviewing tonight are available on the city's website. Um, and in addition, the, um, uh, the materials as we discuss them will be brought up on the screen by um, Andy Port. So we will begin with our first application for 177 State Street Minor Site Plan Review. I believe the applicant it has a representative here tonight. Is it uh, TJ Melvin? Yes. Thank you. Go right ahead. Uh, uh, so my name is TJ Melvin with Millennium Engineering here on behalf of the applicant uh, for the project at 177 State Street. Um, it's also known as Three Newberry Port Turnpike in Newberry. Um, so uh, we were in front of the board a few months ago. Uh, the the plan for the site is a mixed use commercial residential building. Uh, the majority of, of the work and the site falls within Newberry. Uh, we do have four parking spaces on the northern portion of the property that are in Newberry Port. Uh, since the last time we were in front of the board, um, we've gone through a few peer reviews. Uh, we, the planning board had uh, contracted a, a third party peer review of an LSP with concerns about the a connection to the water and sewer. Um, they kind of reviewed all the plans and made some uh, suggestions regarding how we make those utility connections and um, the type of trench that we use. Um, other than that, they really didn't have any other issues. Uh, we've gone through three reviews with the town of Newberry's peer review, um, and we've made some slight modifications to the parking layout, um, changed some plantings in the fire retention area out behind the building. Um, but ultimately no, no major changes have been made since the last time we were in front of the board. Um, I know there were some comments from Newberry Fire uh, that were brought to our attention. Um, and I spoke with the Lieutenant earlier, this, uh, earlier today um, and the revised layout that we have uh, seems to address all of his comments, but he's gonna be discussing that further with the chief, but uh, he believes that should satisfy any of their concerns. Um, and at this point with Newberry, um, we believe we've made all the site changes. Uh, we're kind of working through the architectural portion now. Um, and that's just a brief overview. I can try to address any specific questions anyone on the board may have. Okay, I'll open it up to the board members. Anyone have any specific questions? Okay, if not, I'll take it back to um, Andy for a uh, confirmation that the staff is in agreement with what the applicant has said and that it's ready to be uh, voted on. Is that correct? 
That's correct. So the applicant did make the revisions that were requested by city departments. Uh, they also uh, complied with the um, recommendations of a licensed site professional for a couple of adjustments to uh, address concerns of the water department to make sure the water supply was protected. Uh, so uh, to our knowledge, all city department uh, comments have been addressed. Uh, and as noted, it's, uh, there's only a small portion of this project that falls within the city of Newburyport. There are no remaining issues to our knowledge. Great, okay. Um, before I ask for a motion, um, I see the one that's been proposed in the staff report. Um, it does not include uh, a m mention of waivers being um, approved. Have we, in fact, uh, approved that waiver or do we need to include it in this motion? I'm sorry I didn't ask you that earlier. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I thought I had thought several meetings back from continuances, the board had already granted those, but I agree that it would make sense to memorialize, memorialize those in the vote now. Okay, I think we did too, but let's just add it in there. So um, I'll read the motion and then I'll ask for um, someone to make it um, on the fly. Motion to approve the minor site plan review application uh, to include um, the waiver for um, narrative of submittals at 177 State Street in accordance with the draft decision provided by the Office of Planning and Development. Do I have a motion to that effect? I make the motion. Thank you, Rick, and second? Second, Alden. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right, I'll call roll call on this one. Alden? Yes. Beth? Yes. Ann? Yes. Leah? Yes. Rick? Yes. MJ? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Uh, Don and Tanya are absent um, for the record. Um, also for the record, um, Tanya's on her way. She's going to be logging in by phone if she hasn't already. All right, that's taken care of. Thank you, Mr. Melvin. Thank you. So we will move on to the Institution for Savings. Uh, let me review the process we're going to follow, which is similar to previous hearings on this app application. Um, and then we will dive right in. Um, we will hear from the applicant and any speakers that they um, wish to uh, bring forward. Then we will have a um, presentation by the chair of the Historical Commission on the latest report that they've provided on this um, latest um, proposal. Then we'll go to public comment. After that, we will close the public comment and have planning board members comment. And at the end, the applicant may respond. And as we've done in the past, we'll probably go back and forth with the applicant and the planning board members. And then we'll determine the appropriate next steps. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Attorney Mead, who is leading the team for this uh, application. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair uh, and members of the board. Happy New Year to all of you. Um, my name is Lisa Mead, Mead Talam and Costa, 30 Green Street, on behalf of the Institution for Savings at 93 State Street in Newport. And with us this evening um, is uh, Mike Jones, who's the President and CEO of the bank, Kim Rock, who is the COO of the bank, uh, Christopher Angelakis and Joanne Tsang of Arc Architecture, uh, Nick Betts of Meridian Engineers, uh, William Young and Judith Selwyn, who are our pre historic preservation professionals. Following our last meeting uh, in November, um, the bank again undertook to implement a significant redesign of the proposed addition. Uh, specifically, when we start to go through the changes, you will see the following. A decrease in the usable square footage from 7,712 square feet to 6,512. The removal of all program space on the first floor and a reduction of the program space on the second floor as a result of that. The removal of the hallway on the first floor. The removal of the loge overhang on the State Street side. The new design features specifically include a return to the brick facade to complement the existing structure, an increased number of windows on Prospect Street facade to better complement the smaller proportion of massing. A hip roof design was employed to decrease the overall height and in massing, including the use of slate shingles. 
copper cornice was added, a mixture of masonry trim features, including two types of bricks to delineate the facades and break up the masking, massing, a mixture of granite, limestone, base lintels, sills, and the area above the garage and aluminum clad windows. The design changes importantly also include the build, uh, a re reduced footprint resulting in the following increased setbacks. So along Prospect Street, uh, the, in, the setback is now five feet, six inches. Along Otis Place, the setback goes from nine feet, nine inches to 24 feet, seven inches as you move closer to Otis Place and Garden. And on the Garden Street side of the building, the uh, setback is now seven feet, seven inches. The generator remains fully enclosed within the building and there continues to be minimal vents and mechanical equipment on the roof. Addis additionally, a significant amount of landscape has, landscaping has been added to both the Prospect Street and Otis Place side. Christopher will also talk about the reduction in the ridge heights of the roof. I would refer my, the board to my prior submission relative to how the application meets the criteria of both the site plan review ordinance and the general special permit criteria. Indeed, the building is now smaller and any changes would have actually improved instead of negatively impacted all of those conditions which I previously provided. You have received a letter from Phil Christensen, the board's peer review engineer, stating that the plans fully meet the board's site plan review criteria. You've received a letter from the fire department and the city engineer, and now also the new water department engineer, all stating they have no issues with regard to the project from their departmental perspectives. We have, as you have also been aware, seen the historic commission again for their advisory report. We do not agree with the commission's conclusion and believe they have misapplied the secretary of the interior standards. The proposed addition is subordinate to the 1870 structure. Given its location and setbacks, as well as roof design, the building also does not detract, but rather comp is compatible with the historic scale and character of the historic structure and setting. To be sure the bank complied with the Secretary of the Interior Standards, not only did they request jo Dr. Judith Selwyn to provide another opinion of the proposal, but the bank engaged William Young, formerly of the Boston Landmark Commission, to provide an independent review of the proposal as against the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Of note, both experts with a combined experience of over 75 years in historic preservation and rehabilitation provided in their separate opinions that the National Park Service regulations specifically state that all aspects of the rehabilitation, including new additions or related con new construction will be reviewed first as they affect the subject historic building and second as they affect the district in which the building is located. While it is true that this specific regulation falls under the tax credit section of the secretary regulations, the National Park Service specifically points to this standard in their technical preservation service guidance entitled Planning Successful Rehabilitation Projects, which specifically provides, and I quote, new additions in historic districts. When a building, when building's historic status derives from its inclusion in an historic district, it is also necessary to look beyond the building itself in evaluating the addition. Relevant guidance comes from 36 CFR Part 67 6B6 of the program regulations, and this guidance makes clear that all aspects of rehabilitation, including a new addition, will be reviewed first as they affect the historic building, and second, as they affect the district in which the building is located, end quote. Now, why would the National Park Service do that? Why would they refer to the tax credit section of the Secretary's regulations? Because where the Secretary's standards are general, as in this instance, the interpreter of those general standards would look to the more specific standards in the same statutory scheme to provide guidance. This is a general rule of statutory interpretation. Indeed, that's exactly what the National Park Service has done through their technical guidance documents, and that is what the bank's experts have done as well. I have provided the foregoing quoted National Park Service document to the planning office for, so you have it for your records. This is important, particularly given the report of the entire Historic Commission dated January 28th. 
While the commission provided an opinion to the board, it should be noted that even among the members of the commission at the meeting, there was a difference of opinion, perhaps because their review had become too subjective and not tied specifically to the secretary's standards and stated guidelines. Before I turn over to the engineer, architect, and historians, I would remind the board of a couple of sections of the DOD specifically. In the determination section of the DOD, the city council states that the city has determined all of the following. One, the architectural, cultural, economic, political, and social history of the city of Newburyport is one of its most valued and important assets. And further in the purposes section, the city council provided, quote, a downtown overlay district is discretionary and the discretionary DOD special permit are hereby established due to the unique land use pattern and architectural, economic, and cultural character of the buildings, structures, and lots, both individually and as a group that are located in downtown Newburyport. The city council in creating the DOD understood the importance of all aspects of what makes up the district, including the economic generators located within the district, be it in the commercial buildings or those businesses within those buildings, the value of the buildings, both commercial and residential, and the land use patterns. In this instance, as Mr. Young has opined to the board, and I quote, the IFS building and adjacent houses have coexisted alongside each other throughout their existence. Thus, the proximity of the bank, a distinguished work of 19th century commercial architecture and its vernacular residential neighbors of the same period is itself a historic condition. Those, thus, the addition does not represent an intrusion within the context, but rather a continuity of historic circumstances. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Nick Betts from Meridian to review uh, the changes in the site plan. So Andy, if you could move to uh, the first page of the site plan. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes, thank you. So this is Nick Betts with Meridian Associates. Um, it's a cover sheet, you can go to the next slide, Andy. So this is the record conditions plan that was done originally. Uh, there's been no changes in this new submission. Uh, this was an additional plan we included that shows the ridge and eave heights that were surveyed of the uh, surrounding buildings. The site plan here, you can see the reduced uh, footprint of the building, the same uh, traffic layout from the previous design, the same parking layout. We still have the 62 spaces, which exceeds the 58 required spaces, as well as the three handicap spaces to meet ADA uh, accessibility requirements. Go to the, yep. Uh, the utility plan here, uh, again, hasn't changed since the last design. Uh, the uh, stormwater is still directed to a subsurface detention facility. Um, Due to their reduced footprint, um, the system obviously works as it was sized for the previous building. So the uh, reduction in impervious area only makes it better as far as reducing the, the stormwater flow rates. Um, as Lisa was saying, this has been reviewed by the peer reviewer, Phil Christensen, who has signed off and uh, from his letter says that from an engineering and stormwater perspective, this project complies with the Newburyport planning regulations. Uh, the connections to the existing city utilities were also approved by the city water department and that would be the uh, water domestic water fire sewer uh, all those connections have been approved the next slide is the landscape plan this is the one that's changed the most um, again because of the reduced footprint it afforded us more real estate to incorporate some landscaping especially on prospect and otis place um, so starting at the traffic island we wanted to maintain as much of that existing vegetation as possible. So the existing tree remains, there's an existing Japanese maple that will remain. And then we've enhanced it with some smaller shrubs. Um, just to the uh, northeast of that, again, at that entrance, we've incorporated uh, some more shrubs and lower perennial plantings, as well as uh, a service berry tree. And then moving along the building, uh, at the back of the sidewalk, there's about six feet of separation. So we're able to incorporate some evergreen shrubs, uh, kind of foundation planting similar to those found at the existing buildings uh, that you know helps soften that transition from the uh, sidewalk to the facade of the building. And then on Otis Place here, we have the largest setback. Um, 
we were able to incorporate a small lawn area, again, continue some foundation plantings uh, consistent with the vegetation found at the existing buildings, as well as two service berry and a larger um, American hornbeam. The trees that we selected were not only suitable for this location, but also uh, taken from the 2018 Newburyport list of recommended trees. Uh, so they are both salt tolerant and native species. Um, and along the concrete walk between the fence and the rear of the building, there are some lower shade tolerant hostas, again, to soften that edge. Uh, the next two sheets, I believe, are details. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. Um, and I would remind everybody that we still do have the bike rack up at the entrance um, on the side near where the ATM machine is. Um, with that, we're going to turn it over to Christopher um, uh, to go through uh, the new architectural drawings. Good evening, everyone. We can hear you before Thank you. you ask. No, that's why I said good evening, everyone. Oh, good. It <laughs> um, worked. Um, so the, we've set this up a little differently. Uh, I, I'm sure a number of you have seen um, this series of images a number of times before. And what you're seeing here is the previous scheme. And so the way we've set up the rest of this presentation as we walk you around the building in the, in the revised design is that we've paired uh, the previous scheme and we've overlaid directly onto the previous scheme, the new scheme. So we can really be clear about what the differences are. And the first section of this is really gonna talk about the dimensional differences because Coming out of last meeting, we listened very carefully to the comments that were made, and it was when it was clear to us that that a number of things that we did to come up with the scheme you're looking at right now did not have the kind of value impact that we thought that the neighbors and that you know specifically the neighbors were looking for. And so, what we heard coming out of last meeting was very much about mass and height and setbacks. And so we, we worked very hard to figure out what it, what it was we can do, including significantly reducing the usable square footage of the building to come up with another scheme. So if we click into the next one, um, this just kind of enumerates some of the key, uh, some of the key statistics that um, setbacks in heights, so ridge height of 37 feet, uh, prospect street setback was essentially you know, a number of inches setback on Otis Place is only a couple feet, uh, tapering down to zero at the, at the corner. Um, and so if you click to the next one, um, our new scheme um, lowers the ridge height significantly to 32 feet three. Um, it goes from a inches setback to a five to six foot setback. And the reason these things have ranges like five to six is because the property line and the face of the building are not necessarily parallel, be parallel because of the variation in the pro property line. We, we want to be transparent about that. It's not always six feet, but um, sometimes it's, it's five. Um, so you'll see, so, so for instance, on the setback and garden, there's a lot of variation between um, how, how far the facade sits back off of Garden Street, but from the, the Garden Street mass, we're setting back um, between nine and 17 feet nine foot nine and 17 foot six. And the setback on the Prospect Street mass um, is, is 24 foot seven back from Otis Place. And that's significant. What you'll, you'll see that in our, in, when we get down onto uh, ground level, why that setback is, is so significant. Uh, but these, these really enumerate sort of the, some of the dimensional changes. Um, slide 15, please. Again, existing, you can click, quick click the, yep. And here we're looking at um, the eave heights, which t tends to be a large topic of conversation. Our, our typical eave height, which means the eave height that is most prominent um, here at 24 foot six on the previous scheme, you can see what the eave heights um, of the three large buildings that are directly across from the project go between 23 foot two and 23 foot five. Click to the next one. And while what you're seeing here is that the eave height hasn't changed, but the perceptual mass of the building has changed significantly. Um, it, so you can see that, that that number has not changed. So we're, we're being very transparent that that eave height is required 
our, our program requires the eve height to be that. If the eve height is not there, then the program is compromised and, and, and the building doesn't work. Um, the next slide, please, 18. Again, we're just flipping um, between old scheme and new scheme, once again. And the numbers are the same, of course, um, on that view. And then we wanted to also show you, yep, click to 20. We also wanted to show you that, that we also looked very carefully about how we could set back off of Garden Street, uh, pro the Garden Street property line uh, more. So we actually were able to find a foot or so that we could push towards Prospect Street and get a little more separation between the adjacent um, buildings in, in our property. So having gone through that, I'm um, going to move directly onto sort of the more architectural views. And we're going to go through that same exercise. So uh, slide 23 is uh, a view that we usually start with looking from State Street uh, back through some of the foliage on the site. Um, and you can click and start to see, at, and we can click through these relatively quickly. Um, you can start to see how the existing um, changes in massing and approach, uh, the materiality here is something that um, helps connect back to both State Street and the existing um, historic properties. I think this is something we heard uh, a lot, um, both from the neighborhood and from the historical commission that, um, and I think there's some debate with the Histor historical commission, but that that the building relating to its commercial, its commercial nature felt like more of a, uh, an appropriate reaction. So we, we return to a brick. Um, yep, you can continue on. So this, I'd like to pause here for a second. So if you go back up, yep, you can see here, it's worth looking at where we were before and then 36 sees where we are now. And this, this, this is how the setback is thought about and really respond, we're really trying to respond to the directly adjacent property. So that really opens up and actually sets a new kind of street face based on the adjacent property where this building really sets back and becomes differential to that particular property, leaving a, a, a pretty large open um, public space there to be used. Um, you can click to the next one. This is just a closer view of that. So between 38 and 39. And this is the corner of Otis Place and Prospect Street. And again, what we're talking about here is sort of a real change in perceptual mass. And this was accomplished significantly by, by um, doing lower, lower roof pitches and doing, um, and doing a hip roof, um, which is something that is pretty prevalent in the, in the overall area, um, especially on the next street over. Um, and so this is not an architecture that is foreign to the historic neighborhood at all. Um, and it's a device that architecturally we can use to really see the desires of, of, of our neighbors who are really talking about the visual perceived mass of the building. We think this is a very significant change um, to bring that the perceived size of that building down. The other tools we use was to add a lot more windows. Um, the windows are much more closely spaced. Um, it, it brings the kind of texture and building, the scale of the building down to a much more kind of residential uh, residential scale as far as the building elements, but the, the nature, the commercial nature of the building is still present in, in its kind of brick facade nature. A detail to, to look at is that to help further break down the masses even more, the two, we, we were looking at two different colors of brick, a lighter brick that matches the 1980s building on the left and a darker brick on Park Prospect Street, really to have this kind of visual separation. And then the, 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 the kind of in-between slot spaces uh, are being uh, planned to be uh, limestone and the whole building would be sitting on a, uh, on a granite base and the roof would be shingled with slate shingles. That's the plan at the moment. And the next, the next um, set of slides is really just a detail showing sort of where we were. You could see that a number of windows and the scale of the windows changed significantly. We really worked on the proportion and materiality of the windows to really bring it into, uh, into a kind of place of scale. And then the, the next two are ones that I think everyone is also pretty, familiar with it, which is the aerials. Um, you can click through this one and you can see sort of how architecturally this is being accomplished with the hip roofs. Um, here I'd like to, yeah, go ahead and pause on 46 for a second. So this is where we actually um, 
yeah, you can go to the next slide, 46. And you can see the kind of uh, landscaping approach and kind of richness of plantings that were available now that we've set back off of Oda Street once again, even including things such as benches to, to kind of be welcoming, sort of welcoming space. It's, it is public space. Um, so that is sort of where we are with that. I think the next series of images you can click through to 48 is a much more photorealistic. So we had some photorealistic renderings done. And so this is, you know, without nothing, there's no landscaping added here until we get close to our building. All these trees are sort of existing and that's how they look. And so what you're seeing is really what you get here. We actually faded the trees a bit so that you can actually see a little bit of the building, but without fading the trees, you wouldn't see much of it. But this is how the building is feeling as we're getting <clears throat> down Prospect Street. This is the type of planting that we're looking at that Nick uh, was describing. And you continue to click through. That's our typical Otis Place view. Looking back down Otis. And this is, this is a, a harder image that we really did want to show what the backside of this looked like as it was um, butting up against the back of the property lines at a Garden Street. And this, this is the facade showing that it's still rich with, with windows. Um, the upper windows uh, would be looking into the actual kind of office space above. The lower windows would be opaque. Um, Spandrel glass that would still feel and look like windows, but would not allow view into the garage. In this, in the aerial, sort of just putting putting it into context. The, the next set set, set of series, we we did the same thing with the shadow studies. We we had a shadow study done uh, last time we talked to you, but we thought it was fair to redo them and put them sort of side by side. Again, this is the previous scheme and you can toggle to numbers into 60 and you can see that the shadow footprint is, is pretty big. Can you go back to 59 for a second? I, there's something I wanna point out here is, is I think there is a lot of talk and concern about, um, about what kind of shadows might be being thrown onto the facades of the adjacent buildings. And I can tell you when you're in our model, what we can see in that, um, there's almost no time of year where our shadows throw, our, or the building throws a shadow above the cell height of the first row of windows of the adjacent buildings. And you can see that by, if you if you look at the 3 p.m. image, if you look at the 3 p.m. image, you actually look at the, the, the building, the buildings to the bottom right of that 3 p.m. image, the, the existing building shadows, they reach out and they almost, they just cross the sidewalk. Our building's eve is no higher than those adjacent buildings. Um, at their peak. And so you can you can safely understand how that shadow is not reaching any further across the, the sidewalk than, than those adjacent buildings. And what um, we had described this last time, but the way we do this is we, we do this at the vernal, you know, at, at both the um, equinoxes and the solstices at nine, 12, and three. And so you can see here at, this is the vernal. If you click the 61, yeah, that, that's the, that's our current scheme. 61 will be the summer solstice, where the shadows, of course, are very short, and they don't even uh, they don't even reach across the street. And with our new scheme, not even even a little bit. Then we get to autumnal at sixty three, and again, it's it's essentially right back where it was in in the vernal equinox, which makes some sense. And then winter winter everything is very low, so all all shadows and uh, are very long and low, especially at nine and three. Um, but even at nine, even at nine and twelve, the shadows are not casting um, terribly long shadows. You can see again the adjacent buildings um, down Prospect Street on our side of the street um, are are not reaching across that sidewalk terribly deep, which suggests they're not throwing deep shadows onto facades um, in the winter. Three p.m. You know every shadow reaches all the way to New Hampshire, so. And that was our shadow studies. The whole, the next series of uh, images are, are just plans. So the plans really are, are technical plans that um, are pretty clear to show what any kind of 
program changes are. The program changes that you might recognize is that we no longer have a program space on the corner of Otis Place and Prospect Street. We no longer have a corridor that goes to it. We no longer have an entryway on Prospect Street. All of this was, um, we removed this program space to really suck the footprint in and really make the building smaller. Um, what the, the result of that, if you click the 69, is that our upper, the upper floor square footage is significantly reduced as well because when you, we pulled this, we didn't have that footprint to work with anymore. Um, so that's that's sort of the plan changes. So I think everyone else is pretty familiar with you know how the relationship of the parking to the office above. If there's any questions, we can certainly go back to that. Elevation and section views. If you click through the elevations, um, this is just a place where we're able to kind of enumerate and compare uh, building heights, what elements of the building, um, what their heights are in relationship to other things like the 1980s building and then 1871 building. Um, again, you can see its kind of uh, size relationship and subordinate nature to especially the historic building um, in these drawings. So if we need to refer to dimension, this is a place where we would go to refer to dimension. And then the next um, series of drawings are just um, more detailed blown up elevations of this particular scheme, showing materiality a little bit more clearly, calling out specific materials. And then in the building sections, again, showing how the hip roofs are um, addressing, addressing building height. And, and thank you for blowing that up. You know, th this is one that we, we've talked about a lot um, about how the section works. And, and you, can, you can start to see how and why uh, that eave height is one that is, uh, is hard, to, uh, hard to lower. Um, it brings it brings all of the everything kind of down in, in, in the, the parking system, um, which the bank requires. Um, you know, we've worked out every possible way we can squeeze inches out of that. And this is sort of where where we are uh, programmatically. So with that, uh, uh, sort of a lightning round through there. Uh, but I think we've all seen a lot of this before. And I'm happy to answer any questions or go back through any one of these images uh, if people have any questions. I think, uh, thank you, Christopher, very much. Um, and with that, um, we'll go to William to wrap up um, our presentation. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, uh, as uh, Lisa has, has introduced and as Chris has um, uh, demonstrated, uh, the design has been considerably modified to reflect the particular character of the bank and, uh, and also the, the adjacent buildings, recognizing the challenge of introducing an addition to a distinguished historic building that happens to exist in uh, a historic district. Um, as, as Lisa has noted, um, the National Park Service uh, guidelines, which provide expanded um, uh, interpretive criteria for the uh, Secretary of the Interior standards, uh, do specify that the primary aesthetic obligation, if you will, of any addition uh, to a historic building within a larger historic district is to relate primarily uh, to, to the building itself. Uh, this has been achieved uh, through the use of the masonry material, um, the uh, traditional fenestration pattern, and also uh, the uh, traditional hip form abundantly present um, in New, Re New Report and in the downtown overlay district. Um, uh, moreover, uh, clad in in, in slate, a, a time-honored uh, traditional and, and natural material. Um, and the, uh, the use, use of the hip, hip form, um, I, I believe does, does, a very, does a very effective job of acknowledging 
uh, the historic bank building, uh, which gives the appearance of having a flat roof. It's it's a it's a, uh, it's, a it's a it's a very low uh, uh, pitched hip within within a parapet, um, but also um, uh, avoiding any any competition with the gable roofs of the adjacent houses. Um, so. Uh, Although the subordination of the addition to, to the original building is, is achieved um, through its, its massing, um, its placement at, at, the, at the rear of the lot to, to, to the point that, that it has virtually no vi uh, visual impact uh, from State Street itself, uh, the, the, the scale um, the materials, the regularity of its fenestration, and the uh, recessive quality of, of the hip roof form uh, are all, all responsive to uh, the, the adjacent residential building. Uh, this slide demonstrates how that is, uh, uh, that, that quality is, is magnified by the manipulation of the setbacks. Um, at the very important corner of Prospect Street and, and Otis Place. And uh, the, the way in, in which the, uh, the angle it admits a, a view uh, down uh, Otis Place and uh, uh, provides um, an enhanced glimpse of, of that, uh, that un unusual a uh, gamble roofed uh, house immediately uh, to the left and about the center of the of the frame. Um, all of all of all of these um, adjustments to to the design um, go far toward uh, serving to to promote um, the uh, relationship of of the addition to the bank. Um, and to the adjacent houses. And uh, as, as, as I noted in, in, in my report and as, and as Lisa um, uh, alluded to in, in, in her introduction, uh, the juxtaposition of a, a masonry bank building and frame residential houses uh, that, that we have here is uh, is is very much uh, a historic circumstance. Um, the the addition um, reflects a continuity of use um, and of a a commercial uh, vocabulary uh, within a uh, a residential context, but one that is every bit as uh, polite and as as responsive to. The adjacent residential buildings, as the original bank building itself, and for for this reason, I I certainly believe uh, that the design uh, meets all of all of uh, your criteria and and those of the National Park Service Secretary of Interior standards. Thank you. Thank you, William. Um, and with that, I think, um, Madam Chair, um, we are done with our initial presentation. Thank you very much. We will move on following the process outlined to a presentation by the Chair of the Historical Commission, uh, Glenn Richards. Would you please take over? Hi, good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, um, well, I'll try to be brief because I know time is somewhat limited, but um, I'm going to assume that the board has had a chance to read uh, the report. So I don't, have, I don't plan to go over the whole thing, but I do wanna focus on just a couple of the key things uh, which have also been raised in the reports of the consultants and the attorney for the applicant. Um, the first thing I just wanna address is in um, attorney Mead's memo, and there was also mention about de debate within the board 
Um, in the memo stated, quote, one member thought the Massacre scale was appropriate, unquote. But uh, I differ on that. Uh, that's not what I heard. And I checked the minutes. The recording is not yet available, but the minutes agree with my recollection, which is what he actually said was that he was more concerned with the proposed materials than the scale, never that the massing was OK. And I just wanted to clarify that because um, there was some, has, was some discussion among the group uh, in thought, thinking about the, the uh, cladding. And uh, I it's my impression that it was more of an issue with the greater mass and that uh, I suspect that, and I think uh, my colleague and vice chair is gonna speak later on about the fact that, uh, you know, about the brick cladding not being quite as much an issue with the reduced mass. And as the report starts out there, there you know, this was a big improvement. Um, so let me just go on to the first major point as to how it is that you have um, two outside consultants and the NHC with our own uh, expertise and knowledge and so forth. How could we arrive at different conclusions? Well, the quote from uh, Ms. Selwyn's opinion uh, where she uh, states, no mathematical or other formulaic definitions are provided to evaluate words like smaller, larger, higher, further, et cetera. All guidance is by necessity generic. Uh, and as NPS Preservation Brief 142 states, every historic building is different and each re rehabilitation project is unique. Therefore, the guidance offered here is not specific but general, so it can be applied to a wide variety of building types and situations. And she goes on to say, in fact, there are no numbers used anywhere in the guidelines to measure or determine if a proposal is consistent with the standards. So you can see how, uh, you know, there is a certain amount of subjectivity to this. So um, now, Andy, I, do you have the, um, the, my document with the illustrations? Uh, Glenn, can you see that? Uh, yes. Okay, good. Thank you. So this is very similar to the first, to an illustration that was in my report. Uh, the purpose of this is to explain why uh, we put so much focus on compatibility with the neighborhood. It doesn't mean we ignore the subject building. The old building, the 1870 or 71 building is there in blue. The proposed, uh, the location of the proposed structure is kind of outlined in red. Um, that in this case, uh, this is a little bit older, so the red goes right to the side, to the, it doesn't have the current setbacks, but that's not the point here. The point is those, all those gray blocks are residential abutting structures. And as Mr. Young just stated, you know, the, the location is so far back on the lot that you barely even see it from State Street, which is where you primarily see the historic structure, and that's where its main facade is. Uh, so it's not that we ignore the main structure. In fact, we devote a considerable amount of research and time and analysis to it and its relationship to the, um, to the, to the new proposal. But you can see why we focus so much on how it's going to affect the immediate area. Okay, so um, uh, let me go on to say here um, the, um, and you know, so there are, you've got the standards, and I think we can agree that um, both you know, the applicants, consultants, and, the, and then we have members of the NHC, I think we can say we're all quite familiar with these standards. And we've quoted them over the four reports over the past year quite extensively. And, and my vice chair might have something more to say about that later. So, so you know, let's look at some of the actual facts. So um, uh, the, and thank you, Andy, you've already moved to the next drawing, which I was looking forward to. So Ms. Selwyn's report says the size of the addition and the historic building are roughly comparable. And all I can say is, you know, look at, this is from the shadow diagrams, but I use that because it was the, an overall plan, overhead plan view that had a more accurate um, outline of the proposal than the older one. And um, I don't know, yeah, it's comparable. You can compare them and you see that, yeah, it's not slightly bigger, which is the word words used in the standards. It's considerably bigger. So, so that's one of the reasons why we were so have always been affected by the mass. We don't dispute that it's much improved, but it's, 
it's still a particular problem and specifically around uh, the fenestration. Um, Mr. Young mentioned that. Uh, I believe Ms. Selman, Selman in her report mentioned it as well. So um, uh, I'm gonna get to that. The, um, uh, I actually skipped ahead one. So let me first, before I talk about the fenestration, talk about this height. And um, Mr. Young felt it was out of place for me to talk about what I called this perceived height of the old building. So Andy, could you go to the third page of my pictures? Okay, so the, the, on the top is a, is a drawing that I took from the applicant's plans, shows the 1870 building. It's the only place you can see the outline of that big um, uh, ornament or frontispiece I refer to it as in the front and a little raised section. Uh, Mr. Young said it was like the most a uh, prominent feature of the building. I think you can look at both the, over, the overhead drawing and the photograph, which is not even as far back on Prospect Street as the proposed addition. It's around where the, where the driveway is. And I think I'm justified to say that one gets a perception of the height of the old building from these, from this environs based on the eave height of the major part of that building, which is especially where you've got the contrast of that um, green copper oxide effect of the, of the copper cornice there and the reddish uh, brick and sandstone and so on. So I think my, uh, my argument on that is, is not misplaced. And that, and that, by the way, is in the ballpark of 23 feet which is uh, roughly comparable to many of the buildings on Prospect Street the, by the, uh, the residences, I mean. So, um, so why are we so, you know, so what's wrong with the height? It's only like 24 and a half feet. So first of all, it is higher than, than this part of the old building. So that it gets to that uh, question of subordination, which again was just mentioned. Um, I think uh, I had, I actually agree with the uh, the applicant that the fact that it's further back on the lot does um, reduce that impact. Obviously, this is not right next to the old building where that would really be a problem. So <clears throat> I don't see the, uh, I don't have a problem with the subordination to the old building, which is not to say we didn't look at that. But um, now in this, Andrew went to an interesting slide here. You see the addition in the back on the left side of this slide. Take a look at where the, um, Second, the windows of the second story are, okay? And um, that was what I wanted to talk about with the fenestration. If you, and there's another one, um, I believe it was the rendering, uh, try page 57, Andy, of their, um, of this presentation you're on now, it's just down a little bit. Okay, um, you can, this one, it's not ideal, but you can see what I'm trying to talk about here. Because of that parking system, uh, the second floor is like 16 feet, give or take, high. So the second story windows are much higher than they would ordinarily be. And if you compare the how those windows, you know, how those facades look uh, right around, you know, uh, facing Garden Street, facing Otis Place. It's the same along Prospect Street, even though you don't see that here. And compare that to any of the, the houses like the ones along Prospect Street, you see that the windows are much closer together reflecting you know, that more normal uh, floor height. And so that's really the, the single biggest problem, frankly, with the whole thing. And it's unfortunate that I know the city ordinances about parking. I know that the applicant has got to deal with that. you know, um, And it's unfortunate because because it's so close, this new design is is so close. Really, if that second floor, you know, if that could only be like, if that eave could just be like, uh, like maybe a foot and a half lower, it would be. I think it would come across. I think it would be probably fine. But you know, maybe they, it just wasn't possible. Um, I think that was the main thing I wanted to say. Uh, other than that, you know, the the thing quoted, um, the piece quoted from the historic district. I think. Um, Ms. Mead quoted it and it may have been quoted elsewhere about uh, uh, new additions in historic district. That one only, 
even though it doesn't quite apply because it says when a building's historic status derives from its inclusion in a historic district, we're not dealing with that here because it's historic in its own right. But even if we were, it's consistent with the overall standards. You always consider the historic building first, the building you're adding to. That's, I mean, there's no argument there. That goes without saying. And we certainly did that. Um, all I'm saying is that given the unusual circumstances here, the design of the old building with that, where the height is really more, you know, you, even in this picture, which is the kind of the front, you can see how prominent that green eave is at about 23 feet compared to the, 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 the entry pavilion there. And it's small, very small section that goes back, not even all the way back. So that's why we felt it's so important to assess the impact on the community that was gonna be most directly affected uh, by this addition. Um, I think that's about all I need to say. Um, uh, if, if Patricia's able to make it, I know she had a class and she might have a couple more comments, but I think uh, that's all I really needed to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're gonna move into the public comment section of the meeting. Um, I'd like to let everyone know that we um, have had available to us on the website, all the letters that were submitted as of this afternoon from the public. And they are posted on the city website for this application at the bottom for anyone who's interested in seeing them. Um, let me remind you of the instructions that I've given in the past. When you speak, please give your name, your address, and limit your comments to two minutes. Um, and I will open it up for uh, the general public. But before I do so, I'm going to call on Mayor Donna Holliday, who has requested to speak tonight. So Mayor Holliday, over to you. Thank you, Chair Sante, I, I appreciate it very much. Um, I first would like to say that in the 11 plus years that I have served as the mayor of the city, I have never come before the planning board um, to speak or for the matter, I s never come before boards to speak. Um, but I felt that given the century plus um, history of the Institution for Savings in our community and how significant this institution has been to our community over a century and that they have financed our uh, saving of our downtown and they have contributed millions and millions and millions of dollars to support our city. They made some missteps in terms of the start of this process. Um, and it really caused a lot of neighborhood angst and concern. But I think since that initial um, introduction of their plans, and they have really listened. They have listened to the neighbors, they have listened to the Historic Commission, and they have listened to feedback from the planning board. I have been following this process for well over a year um, from behind the scenes, uh, reading the reports, following the meetings, and I believe this new design is a significant improvement. I was very discouraged by the collaborative design and I was very pleased to see that they went back to uh, a brick facade. They have reduced the height. They have uh, introduced setbacks, which I think are really significant for the neighborhood. They are addressing the 62 parking spaces they need. And overall, I believe that this redesign meets the requirements of the site plan criteria. I believe it also meets the downtown overlay district, even the historic commission, although I can say from Glenn's presentation, they aren't 100%, but they recognize the significant uh, effort and improvement in this design. I um, really support 
this project. I support um, what they have worked on and invested a tremendous amount of time and energy to try and meet all of the requirements um, that are very complicated for this particular site. But this is in our downtown and I would ask that the members of the planning board approve and support uh, these significant changes that the Institution for Savings had put before you tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Andy, would you please? Um, yes, thank unmute, you. Unmute the first speaker. Uh, first person we have in the audience is uh, Colleen Turner. If you'd like to unmute on your end. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Excellent. Um, quite frankly, Attorney Mead and right now, Mayor Holiday, now in the 11th hour, I'm so disappointed in you and Mike Jones and Kim Rock, Christopher A, I don't even know how to say your last name, and William Young, whoever you are, I'm beyond disgusted with your disingenuous arguments that I and numerous tax paying neighboring residents to whom you have failed to reach out ever, not to mention the disregard you've had for the historic commission and for this planning board for well over a year now, y'all seem to think the rules don't apply to you. Well, they do. So it's not an addition, you are changing the fabric. The reality is your suggested structure continues to be too tall, too big, entirely too much in its massing scale and size. And every iteration you present insults, not only your very gorgeous 1870s original bank structure, but it insults the 80 plus residents of the neighborhood surrounding you. To paraphrase the prescient and uh, advice from the great artist and lyricist Nat King Cole. You're the monkey looked the buzzard right dead in the eye and said, your story's very touching, but it's a lie. Straighten up and fly right. Straighten up and stay right. Scale down IFS or you're gonna blow your wad. I'm done. Next speaker, please. Hey, uh, next speaker is Elizabeth Hurley. Mm -hmm. wow. Elizabeth, are you with us? Uh, this is me, uh, Frank Cousins, uh, Andy. This is Frank Cousins from the New Report Chamber. Oh, okay. Thomas, and um, I'm in the Chamber office. And uh, I'd like to, uh, first of all, my name is Frank Cousins. I live at uh, 242 Water Street here in New Report. I'm the president of the New Report Chamber of Commerce. Um, I appreciate the work that the institution has done to scale down the size of the project and uh, come up with what I see is a, a very good uh, alternative. They've been in front of the board a couple of times. More importantly, um, in my position as the president of the Chamber of Commerce, I serve on the Economic Development Action Committee, um, which is chaired by uh, Julie Ganong. And uh, we've heard a presentation uh, from the institution a couple of times on this. And just recently at our last meeting um, after these changes, and uh, I wanna thank you, Andy, who uh, gave us some information about the changes and gave the presentation to the committee. Um, we decided to uh, go on the record. Uh, the committee uh, voted uh, to support uh, the changes and. Um, what the institution has done. Uh, we had a couple members that did abstain. One was in a butter, um, but um, the committee felt very committed uh, about the importance of having the institution for savings in downtown Newport and anchoring our downtown along with the Newport Bank. Uh, there are last two mutual banks um, that we have in, in the greater Newport area and they're committed to our community and all of the citizens. And I think that uh, the additional uh, people that they will employ will be a positive thing for downtown, clearly additional tax dollars for the city of New Report. And I think, um, you know, the history of the institution speaks for itself. And, uh, you know, I, I feel that uh, in these times, having a strong downtown is very, very important. And with that, um, you have a letter uh, of support 
And uh, I appreciate also Mayor Holiday for speaking tonight also. So thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Um, next speaker is Steve Charette. Thank you, Madam Chair and Planning Board members for the opportunity to be heard. My name is Steve Charette. My wife and I are direct abutters and live at 16 Prospect, which is on the corner of Prospect and Otis, 45 feet from the proposed expansion. We are also Newburyport business owners and our office is located on State Street. Uh, as both uh, homeowners and business owners in the city, we don't object to the bank reasonably and sensibly expanding their operations. Uh, the latest design is an improvement and we appreciate that it provides some visual relief from our vantage point living on the corner. Uh, we also appreciate the generator being housed inside to reduce noise. However, we do oppose the project as presented based on the height, scale, and massing. We support the conclusion of the Newburyport Historical Commission and rules set forth by the Secretary of Interior Standards. The passage of a year, the simple passage of time, irrespective of the fact that it's a year that none of us will ever get back, does not relieve any of us of our duty to ensure that this is a responsible project. I say that while sincerely thanking all of you for your service and steadfast resolve to do what's right for all stakeholders. The bank made a conscious decision to expand to house seven employees in this location rather than building on State Street or housing them at one of their 14 other locations throughout Essex County, which is their choice, but it's also incumbent upon them to propose an expansion that is subordinate and set, and this fourth rendition still is not. The size of their assets, deposits, loan balance, or the $69,000 in property tax that they currently pay to the city are completely innocuous arguments for this process. Their viability as a 200-year-old asset-rich bank may hinge on fintech innovation and on continuing to execute on other solid business principles, which have earned them success, but it certainly does not ride on this project as proposed. We ask that you deny this project as presented and hang in there one more time if the bank decides to either build directly on State Street or to make this project more sensible and reasonable. They're open minute, for eight or so hours per week. This affects us all 168 hours every week forever. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, Freeman Cotton. And uh, Freeman, if you're there, you'll have to unmute on your end as well. Uh, Freeman, we'll pass over you just a moment. Uh, circle back if you're able to get your mic to work. Um, next person we have is Paula Renda. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes we thank can. you. Hi, I'm Paula Renda. I live at 16 Otis Place, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, first of all, I, I think we have no doubt that the Institute has been uh, a very generous uh, organization. Um, and I would like to start with um, saying that I really appreciate the setbacks on Otis and Prospect. Um, in, in addition to uh, some full shaded trees, I think that would soften the building. Um, as Steve Charette um, indicated, and I agree with him, that still the, the structure is just too massive and, and too large for our neighborhood. It doesn't complement it in any way. Um, I'm really concerned about the scale of this mass. It looks very factory-like and institutionalized and doesn't fit in with the clapboard historic houses um, of our neighborhood, which is very congested already. Um, in addition, um, aside from the structure itself, if work was to begin, um, we have had two other fairly large projects in our area where for almost two years, we hardly could find a parking space. Um, it's a constant battle for us. And with snow removal, it's even more um, difficult. 
Um, in addition, I worry about the upkeep of the landscaping and um, the clearing of the sidewalks, which the Institute does not take care of on Otis Place. So I, there are many concerns, but all in all, the mass minutes is my major concern. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker we have is Aaron Clausen. Hello, um, this is Ann Clausen speaking for Aaron and myself. We live at three Otis Place. And thank you planning board for listening to us uh, yet another time. Uh, I'd like to mirror um, what Steve Charette said. Um, we do live here around the clock and not to say that the IFS has not helped the community, but this has nothing to do with that. The building is too high. The size is too large and massing. Um, I, we strongly, as a family, oppose this building. Um, and just looking to the, for the planning board to please deny this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I uh, just wanted to circle back. Freeman Condon, are you there? Andy, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. My name is Freeman Condon and I live at 6 Forest Road in Salisbury. I am a member of the Board of Trustees of the Institute of the Savings. This project is better, safer, and more attractive because of the scrutiny of the planning board. We listened to your concerns and suggestions and made a good faith effort to incorporate them wherever practical. There was an old adage that everyone is entitled to make up their own minds they are not entitled to make up their own facts. It is a fact that the bank has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on engineering and architectural redesigns. It is a fact that we seek no dimensional zoning relief. We comply to height limits, exceed setback requirements, and meet parking standards. It is a further fact that for us to remain competitive, we need additional space. The older I get, the more nostalgic I become. On my daily walks, I think of growing up in Newport and of her storied history. One of my earliest local heroes was Donald McKay. McKay owned a wharf behind Interlocks and produced magnificent clipper ships. His most famous, the Flying Cloud, was not built here because McKay abandoned the city for greener pastures. I think of Nabisco, which started here, but has long since left. And I think of Toll Silversmiths. Toll was the General Motors of the new report of my youth. They employed hundreds of my neighbors and relatives, but Toll sold out to a corporate rival and fled the city, as well as leaving its iconic building vacant and deteriorating for decades. The Institution for Savings will never join that exodus. You will never see a national corporate logo on the corner of State and Prospect Street. But the IFS is a mutual bank owned by its depositors. Its bylaws assure us that it will always minute. remain a mutual bank and will always stay in this city. Tonight, I earnestly and respectfully ask you to move this project forward. Not on my behalf. I ask you to approve it on behalf of the owners of 69,848 deposit accounts who believe having ownership in a local bank is a desirable thing. I ask you to approve this request because it is in the collective best interest of all of New Report citizens. Thank you. Next speaker, Tom Kultajan. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Tom Kultajan, 64 Federal Street, co-president of the New Report Preservation Trust. With the much anticipated institution's revised plans, the trust had hoped to support them. We really wanted to support the next plans. Unfortunately, although they are much improved as they are smaller, they do not meet the standards. Clearly the Newburyport Historical Commission does not feel they meet them. The trust agrees with the Historic Commission. The project remains too massive, 
it's going in the right direction, but it yet again needs to be revised downward. One positive note is the addition uh, to the smallest, in addition to the smaller size is reverting back to the brick. This seems more consistent with a commercial building. It can't be made what it isn't, and it is not a residential building. Brick seems more consistent with the main historic structure as well. This project still impairs the integrity and character of the neighborhood. It is still detrimental to the neighborhood. This proposal is not in harmony with the purpose and intent of the DOD. You have, for, have heard and will continue to hear from countless abutters, neighbors, and others within the city. This is a massive project still, and the neighbors deserve relief and a resolution of their concerns. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, Peter Mackin. Uh, Peter, are you able to unmute on your end? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, this is Peter Mackin, 13 Prospect. I live directly across the street from the entrance to the current uh, surface parking. Um, I don't know that anyone can say it better than Steve Charette did with regard to uh, the entire picture of, from a neighborhood perspective. Uh, we were very glad to see finally after one year, some recognition to the input from the neighbors in this current proposal. But it's at the end of the day, it, the space is absolutely too small for such a large building. It's like trying to put 10 pounds into a five pound bag. The height, the size, and the mass totally overwhelms the historic neighborhood. And it's two times larger at least than the original uh, building on State Street. It totally changes the character of the residential historic neighborhood forever. Um, it's really hard on our port to believe that the growth of this company, okay, this bank, uh, it, to accommodate only seven more employees would require such a large structure. I never thought it would be any higher than a simple one-story building with a 14 to 16 foot high eave, like the loan building on the corner of Prospect and State. We uh, never heard the bank consider other locations or any creative use of the bank's current space on State Street. So we totally recommend that the planning board deny this special permit uh, to the bank. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I see no other hands at this time, Chair. Uh, actually, hang on just one moment. There are a few others. Uh, Patricia Pecknick. Hi, yes, Patricia Pecknick, Ford Dove Street. I wanted to say something quickly on the topic of materials. The Historical Commission support for the pitched roof and clabbered proposal was really because at one point the bank had explained that the addition would be so far away from the historic building that it would read as a separate structure. So we were thinking about the kind of materials the standards would require if the structure would read as separate new construction set among wooden houses. And the idea then was to draw from the buildings. The bank's consultant was available for questions at that meeting where that design was proposed. And so apparently the consultant, you know, agreed then that the plan was an appropriate treatment that comported with the standards. And those discussions then went forward. But a way to resolve the materials discussion, in my opinion, is to say that if the addition can be reduced in size so that it doesn't read as a separate structure, if its height and massing are reduced so that it really will read just as an addition and not a second building, then I agree with Mr. Colterjohn that, you know, brick is the appropriate historical idiom and the hip roof design and the other elements, the slate shingles, the wood trim, the masonry, the limestone, the granite base, all would, in my view, speaking just for myself, satisfy the standards for compatibility with the existing historic building materials. 
I'm afraid that on an addition of the current scale, no materials can really work the magic of making, you know, the parking garage comply with the height, size, and massing standards. And so I agree with uh, people who've, who've raised that concern. And finally, you know, the mission of, of our commission is to protect, preserve, and promote Newburyport structures, neighborhoods, and landscapes. And so we did review the proposal in its totality and its impact on the entire setting. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, Claire Papadatsu. I hope I'm not uh, mispronouncing that. Who? Can you hear us? Yes. Oh, thank you, thank you. My name is Claire Papanas to see you. I reside at Fort Otis Place. Um, I would like to echo my neighbor's concerns uh, about the recent design. It is an improvement. No one's arguing that. Uh, also, too, no one has been arguing about the IFS's reputation and generosity in the community. It really has never been about that. It's been about this the expansion, which continues to be too large. The new design is an improvement. So I feel like we're talking in circles and it's, um, you know, we have a different set of facts, but it's the same dynamic. It comes down to the fact that the bank is, is weighing on its influence and power to get what it wants. No one is denying the bank its opportunity to expand. All we're asking for is to work with the neighborhood and the city to build something that's more appropriate, less intrusive, that won't impact our neighborhood negatively. I think these are fair requests. And I think the fact that you, the mayor actually spoke at tonight's meeting is a testament to your power and influence. And that's a concern of mine. Thank you. Chair, Chairperson Sontag, may I also speak? This is Mark Griffin. Yeah, we'll start the clock again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to first off um, sort of, you know, highlight the the positives uh, from the most recent uh, iteration of the plan that the IFS has presented. Um, you know, they have reduced the size by 1,000 square feet, I guess, of programmatic space. I'm not entirely sure what that means. Um, there's been some sort of wordsmithing uh, throughout this process on uh, square footage. So I would hope that the planning board would drill down on that. Um, but they've also uh, created a setback on Otis Place, which is, um, I think, a very positive, uh, you know, uh, something that uh, ha has transpired. Um, on my side, I'm not quite as uh, positive. We only got six inches of setback. Um, and I know that the planning board had actually mentioned that they wanted to see some setback over there. I don't know if six inches is what, you know, you consider to be sufficient. Um, all, on the so-called you know negative side, it's still you know huge. Um, it's one sixteenth reduction from what they started out as at sixteen thousand square feet. Maybe they're down to fifteen thousand if that's what programmatic space means. Um, so you know it's a it's a very small reduction uh, compared to what we started out with, um, and it took them a year to get there. So before we pat them on the back too much. You know, let's examine what exactly has transpired. Um, I, I think that you know there's still a ways to go. Um, I agree with the new report, historical commission report. Um, the footprint uh, and the massing are issues. Uh, have we made progress? Yes, yes, we have. Um, the other comments with respect to the bank's viability that's in the staffing report. The mayor's comments and some of the trustees' comments and the uh, president of commerce comments about the bank's viability, all irrelevant to the DOD criteria. Thank you very much. Our next person, Richard Pollack. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, my name is Richard Pollack. I own the property on 135 and 7 Garden Street. I'm a direct uh, abutter to the bank's property in my backyard. And um, in appearance, this new structure that they've come up with doesn't, doesn't fit into the historical character of the neighborhood uh, Newberry tries to maintain and certainly does not belong in a neighborhood setting. Um, 
you know, I, I agree with the historical commission, you know, it's, it just doesn't fit. And, uh, you know, it's like a, a factory building to me, uh, you know, where there's houses all around, we got a factory building coming into the, into the neighborhood. Um, with the several plans that have been uh, presented, not one changes our objections, it's just too big, too tall, too massive, and too close. Even though they did put two, I guess two for two more foot on my lot line, and I'm I'm glad they enclosed the generator that's been making a lot of noise in the backyard for the last uh, ten years, ever since it's been there. So, so I I I wish the planning board to deny their request for the present design. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, Sean Sullivan. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, uh, hello, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. This is Sean Sullivan. Uh, I live at 9 Prospect Street. Uh, I'm directly across the, the street from the proposed structure. Um, and I first wanna say um, thank you for, uh, I appreciate the bank's first real changes to this proposal. Uh, in the course of a year, uh, there's been a lot of back and forth, but this, this latest design, uh, for me, the setback is, is significant. Um, the setback on Prospect Street of five to six feet um, and the corner of Otis uh, is, does make a change to it. Um, I, I don't feel that uh, you know, Mark and Claire have gotten any relief um, from the setback, but uh, I think it is a step forward there. Um, I feel the height of the building is still too high. I have to agree with the, uh, as an owner of a historic home, uh, I have to agree with the historic commission that um, this is simply uh, too large and not subservient to the original structure. Um, I think Glenn Richards, you know, diagram earlier uh, says it best. It's just not even in the ballpark of being smaller or, sub or subservient to the original building. And, you know, I, I'm glad that we've made some advancements on this. And I'm sure there will be some people jumping on the call saying the neighbors will never be happy with, with any proposal that comes. But uh, I, I am happy to see the changes um, that have been made. And I would say that I think Mr. Richards' uh, diagram points out that this plan is fundamentally flawed on the size of scale and height. And, and I'm, I, quite frankly, I don't know how you fix something that that's, is that grossly out of balance. Um, but I, I do ask the planning board to take that into consideration that it is simply such a large structure trying to be forced into the back part of this lot. Um, two minutes. And there has been nice changes, but it's still just too big. And I would ask you to deny it on that basis. Thank you. Uh, next person, Kay Flaherty. Uh, Mr. And Mrs. Flaherty, you'll need to unmute on your end as well. Can't see you. No, I know, but you have to. If you don't like it, you have to. Okay, I will uh, hold on that for a moment. Uh, Tim Wacker. Hello? Yes, hi. Uh, hi, uh, Tim Wacker, Tim and Laura Wacker at 13 Otis Place. We're at the uh, intersection of Garden and Otis. I've uh, stated a number of times the, the many points that I see uh, for opposing this project. I don't see any reason to restate them now. Uh, nobody has taken, or at least it doesn't seem to me that the traffic issue is being, is being given due consideration. But I just, the one question I wanna ask, and I appeal to someone on the board to ask the bank representatives this question, why this location? When you have 14 other locations, can you please explain to me why this location? When it's obviously so onerous on the neighbors surrounding the property. Uh, that's all I have to say, thank you. Um, 
see no other hands raised at this time. I do see uh, we had one phone caller. Uh, if you are calling in and you're interested in speaking, just to be clear, um, you can press the key sequence on your phone, star nine. Uh, that will let us know that you'd like to speak and um, we can uh, unmute you. Um, we do have another person who's raised their hand, Gary Karellis. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Andy. We all know what the bank has done for the community. That cannot be minimized. For us to hear continuously how much the bank has donated to the city is not relevant to this discussion. While we all have seen many iterations of the expansion plans for the bank and currently see an aesthetic improvement, the size remains a significant issue. The size can be reduced or alternatively, the expansion could be built at the front of the parking lot or at another of the bank's locations. This has been suggested numerous times before and the idea of having the expansion somewhere else has not been addressed. The current plan still adds to more congestion on Prospect Street, Otis Place and Garden Streets all which are very tight right now. I personally am concerned about my properties, which are directly across the street from this expansion, which are at uh, 15, 17, and 19, 21 Prospect Streets. Not enough has been done to, in the design of this expansion to prevent the addition from blocking views, taking away sunlight, or making the corner even darker, thereby making all rooms facing Prospect colder. The bank has talked today about the hip roof for the, for the expansion as something addressing the concern of the neighborhood. A hip roof is not addressing the height of the building. The Historic Commission mentioned tonight that eaves should be lower. I am still opposed to the current plan and respectfully request that the Planning Board deny the bank's request for the expansion in its current form. The neighborhood and the abutters, dozens of whom have expressed concerns since this project was first proposed, need to have more of their concerns met. The abutters live in this area 24 seven. Thank you. Hey, uh, I see no other raised hands at this time, Chair. So we shall close the public comment section. Thank you to everybody who spoke. Um, we're gonna move on to planning board member comments. And uh, I want to mention at this point that we also have in attendance attorney Jonathan Eichmann from KP Law, who is here to advise the planning board as needed. Um, that is the city um, solicitor or the city's council, sorry. Um, I'm going to ask the board members to speak um, individually, and I will um, make my specific comments at the end. I do want to make um, a statement up front, however, um, and it has to do with how we operate as a board. Um, the board always works with applicants with the expectation of achieving a positive outcome, otherwise known as working toward yes. The planning board is performing its due diligence for this application to ensure the proposed addition to the Institution for Savings meets the criteria for a special permit within the downtown. If board members thought this was not the proper place to expand the bank's footprint, we ha would have made that clear long ago. With each iteration of the proposal, the board has raised specific concerns and asked for appropriate response from the applicant. Concerns about height and massing have dominated all of our conversations, and uh, it's no different tonight. We will keep the conversation open until such time that at least a supermajority of members, that means six members, find the applicant has provided a solution to those concerns and others that have been raised. That is our my optimistic um, expectation and um, I will leave it at that in terms of what we're trying to do here and turn it over to board mem members to individually um, give your reactions to this latest proposal and everything you've heard tonight. Who would like to go first? Okay. 
If nobody volunteers, I'll call on you. So I think you might want to volunteer. <clears throat> Uh, this is Anne. Um, <clears throat> I very much like the um, the decrease in the square footage of the new design. Um, very much liked the uh, increased setbacks and addition of landscaping. I think that softened things quite a bit. Um, I also like the brick, which um, is in keeping with the original structure. And I don't find it being intrusive in the otherwise um, clabbered residential neighborhood. Um, all those things are great. I still don't know if the project as described by our local historic commission meets the interior standards. And I think we all would feel much more relieved if more people in the neighborhood um, had embraced this uh, redesign. I think everyone welcomed it and you know once again step in the right direction um i don't know this is a this is a really difficult one i i like all the changes i i just don't know if they're enough i guess that's all i i have right now i this is a tough one. <clears throat> um, I, I can I can speak, Bonnie. Thank um, you. Uh, it, it's it's not there for me yet. Um, I appreciate the, uh, as Anne said, I appreciate the recent gestures, the space on Otis Street, um, even some vegetation on um, Prospect Street, and and the more space given to the sidewalk. Um, for me, it always came down to the architecture, and that means scale and massing, but also um, the, how it's detailed and how, it, in particular, what strikes me about this um, iteration is that the, the facade on um, Prospect Street is really pretty harsh. Um, I, I, I know that there's a, there was a comment about uh, the, the design respecting traditional fenestration patterns. And I, I would uh, respectfully submit that this is, is not um, a traditional pattern. I mean, the traditional pattern, yes, they align second floor and first floor and, and they're often equally spaced and symmetrical. Um, that would be traditional, but this is like a, a, a row of soldiers. Um, you know, there's just, this is, this is a, um, not a, not reflecting the traditional pattern of the residential, um, which was so, I think, really aptly pointed out um, that this is surrounded by residential um, homes um, in that graphic uh, that was shown to us. Um, and, and also they, they, they almost come so close. If you, if you think of uh, the, the facade on Prospect Street as being too, buildings, which are sort of com meet in the middle. Um, the one on the right has those five symmetrical windows, symmetrical with a uh, below. It's almost so close to a federal building, but it is so clearly not a federal building that I find it very visually disturbing. Um, and the one on the left is has six windows in, uh, um, in a row. Um, and, and that's almost like making fun of the one on the right, which is not a federal building, but sort of wants to be. Um, it just, it's, just, it's just a really harsh facade. And I don't know what um, traditional fenestration pattern it's supposed to be reflecting. Um, 
I'm also very curious about the size of the windows. They seem huge relative to the windows in the neighborhood. And I understand that it might be proportional with the massing of the building, but then we get into the whole discussion about the massing being too much. Um, and that one is a real stickler for me because I don't know how you reduce the height and get the parking in. I just, that, I'm, I'm stymied uh, at that. I, I don't know how you solve that problem. Um, just looking to see if I had any other comments. And, and I, I guess I don't, I guess that's the biggie for me. A couple little things like, um, I don't, if, if there's a suggestion that this might be slate, I would like to really know for sure, is it gonna be slate or is it gonna be faux slate? Cause faux slate I've never seen successfully done in my personal opinion. Um, and then finally, again, back to the windows. And um, I've seen repeatedly that the lower windows are, um, drawn, and maybe this is just how they're drawn, but they're drawn as cottage style, meaning the upper sash is shorter than the lower sash. Um, again, it just seems weird. But overall, it's, it's not there for me yet. And that's it. Oh, what well, can I just say one more thing also? The, yeah. the harshness of the facade goes a lot to the massing of it. it it's just, I don't know why the, that length of building isn't broken down in uh, somehow. It's, it's very flat, very two-dimensional, and um, it, it, it reads as one ginormous building. And I don't know why that massing, this is like, this is the, I feel like I'm a broken record with many projects that come into us. I don't know why the massing isn't broken down into some more uh, sizes that are familiar to Newburyport. I'm done. Oh, oh, wait, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, I'm curious about the, the missing entry um, that, that you could see from State Street, um, why the entry is no longer there. I actually thought that that added some animation to uh, the, the building. And I liked the idea that it seemed penetrable. Um, whereas right now it, it, it doesn't seem like a building you even penetrate from the street. So. Um, and certainly the garage door is suggestive, suggest, um, you know, non-pedestrian, non-participatory, um, impenetrable. So I, I wonder what happened to that entrance. You think you're finished now? Yes. Great. Okay. Next person, please. I'll go ahead. Um, this is Beth. Uh, I agree with Leah about the lack of an entrance um, or a visible entrance. Uh, also about the length of the Prospect Street building um, and that it needs to be broken up. Um, I also appreciate the setbacks and the vegetation. Uh, I do have concerns still about the massing. Um, I think it appears subordinate to the historical building only from the State Street side. Um, otherwise, if you're looking at it from anywhere else, I think it it is clearly much larger um, and is overwhelming. Um, I am curious last time that um, we looked at this project, we suggested maybe taking some parking um, away from the site. Um, and I'm just curious as to whether there was any consideration of that. Um, also, I was looking at the um, Secretary um, and Park Service guidelines um, and they talk about using current existing um, space before embarking on an addition. Um, and I, I know I have raised it in the past about could some use be made of the existing space um, in order to be able to reduce the size of the addition? And I am just wondering, you know, how thoroughly the bank has considered that. I think um, in the past when I've asked it, it's just been pretty dismissed um, as definitely not possible. I just would like to know whether the bank has given consideration um, and what kind of consideration the bank has given to changing the existing space, reducing some of the parking on site in order to maybe make this a bit smaller um, and more 
in line with um, the historic building and the setting. So those are my comments. I can go next, this is MJ. Thank you. Um, I guess I felt all along that the program is just too large for the site and it's said been mentioned repeatedly, um, but I thought I'd start with that because it just seems very obvious to me that that is the largest issue would be for us. Um, I believe the example that Glenn from the Historic Commission gave of the um, size of the building in relationship to the original, um, it's just clear to me. It's, it's just trying to get too much onto a little teeny spot. Um, it's, it just doesn't still seem to be working. I appreciate all the efforts. I think the landscaping along Prospect Street is an incredible help. The brick gives it a little bit more stateliness. Um, so I do appreciate many of the um, efforts that have been made. Um, I guess one of the biggest problems I have is the garage door. Um, it just needs to be softened somehow, that entry. As Leah said, there's no pedestrian. Um, it just, it turns you away um, as a pedestrian, but I mean, that's understandable, it's a garage, but now I just feel like we're adding another garage to the city. Um, and I just don't feel like it's really in character with the neighborhood, which goes back to the DOD. So um, I don't think I have anything different than any, anyone else has said. Thank you. Okay. Who does that leave? I think it leaves me. Yeah. Right. Uh, I've been holding off because I'm not really sure my contributions are going to be that helpful. But um, you know, I've been I've been saying at most meetings uh, that I was concerned because it seemed this project seems to be perpetuating a mistake that was made in the probably in the 1970s by creating that empty tooth along State Street and that the project doesn't show any appreciation for the, the site's context on a historic commercial main street. Um, and so, you know, we have this parking lot and a kind of very non-contextual sculpture slash fountain slash clock in the most prominent place at the corner. And it, it just makes, it just seems so obvious to me that where you would build a building is on the main street rather than in the neighborhood. And, and I guess, I think we've, I think the board as a whole has moved beyond that. And, and certainly the bank has not heard that suggestion um, or responded to it. And um, so I'm not sure that I have anything positive to, 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 to provide, I think. I guess that's, it's, um, it does seem like it's a, a it would be a, a huge lost opportunity not to be able to restore a street frontage along along uh, State Street in this location. Um, the, the building, the current building, I think there's nothing wrong with the current building. I mean, I, I, I don't have the architectural design sensitivity that other members of the board have, but I don't feel there's anything wrong with that building in a different location. It, it seems to me, my, my reaction to it is it looks like an imitation mini mill. And there are places in Newburyport where there's a, a factory building facing a, um, a residential neighborhood. And so if, if, you, if, there were, if it were appropriate to create a, a mini mill in this location, that would be, that might be okay. I just don't think, I agree that the scale is wrong for that far back in the lot. It would, be, would work much better or something maybe with a little bit more, um, architectural detail would work better at the front of the lot. Uh, and I agree with the comment that a couple of people have made that this is only subser subservient from one of the four sides of the property. It's, it's subservient from, from the view that we're looking at now uh, from, from State Street, but it's certainly not subservient from 
Prospect Street or Otis Place or, or Garden. And, and so it's, that's a struggle. And I, I do feel like it, it doesn't, um, it is out of context with its surroundings. And then one question that I have, and I, I have not been able to find anything on this in, in guidance or regulations or anything like that, but the, this whole issue of an addition being subservient, whether subservient means smaller or whether it means only slightly larger. Um, doesn't, this doesn't take into account the cumulative additions to the building. So it seems to me that, you know, we're ignoring that, that, early, that addition that's already there at the back of the building. And so when you look at all of the additions to this historic building, they're hugely more, um, hugely larger than the, than the original building. There's, there's really nothing, except for the fact that they're behind the building from, as seen from State Street, there's really nothing subservient about the cumulative additions. Um, but as I say, um, it seems to me that the whole discussion is accepting that the, the commercial part of this, of this development is going to be moved into the residential neighborhood. So I, maybe my comments are not very helpful. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Um, my specific comments um, are similar to those you've already heard. I do think progress has been made um, with the setbacks and the landscaping, um, if for no other reason than the, to mitigate the size of the addition, but there are other benefits that have already been spoken to. Um, and of course, anyone who looks at those will say they aren't typical for that neighborhood. Well, a special permit, if we believe something is good for the proposal um, and for the overall design, the special permit allows us to uh, approve something um, that wouldn't ordinarily be allowed um, under other, um, either under existing zoning or in other circumstances. So I think we wouldn't have any trouble um, approving those larger setbacks in that landscaping. Um, the brick of the building, I'm okay with actually. I think it was a good experiment, but it just didn't work to try with the clabbered. Um, it reflects the downtown commercial buildings and um, it does unfortunately because of its location intrude into um, a clabbered faced um, set of buildings, residential structures um, around it. But there are plenty of examples of that. Um, however, being brick leads to other challenges um, for the architect. And that's what you've heard, we've heard from each other and from um, other speakers tonight. Um, the additional design features overall, let me just start with the positive, um, go further than previous proposals to break up the massiveness of the facades. Um, but I'd like to see more, more in that direction. Um, I think the Otis Street side does a very good job of breaking up the facade with two different colors of brick and a clear recessed um, piece in the middle with limestone there. I'd like to see something like that here, what we're looking at right now. Um, it would, I don't know what it does to their internal programming and it's not our business to be involved with that. But if it were possible to make one and possibly two, I'll call them indentations like there is on Otis Street, it would, look, it would read um, more as three individual buildings. Um, and I think that would really help a lot um, to break up this sense of a heavy brick building. Um, that being said, clearly the, the limestone, um, um, I've forgotten what they're called, pieces above the windows, um, break it up now. Um, and the copper and the hopefully real slate hip roof um, are an improvement. Uh, the copper around the edge, the cornice. Lentil. Lentil was what I was looking for. <laughs> Thank you. I know these terms and they go out of my head when I'm 
trying to make a point. Um, that's the bit above the window. Um, the overall height, I agree, is still a problem, um, both as the addition fits with and should be subordinate to the existing original building, and also how it fits into the neighborhood. Um, going along with what the um, Historical Commission said, I prefer that the applicant use that wing section of the um, original building that I believe was added on in the early 1900s um, as the guiding height, because that's what you really see when you start down Prospect Street. Um, you have to go up to um, the, Andy, if you're trying to find the example of what I'm talking about, it's looking at the original building from the side. Yes, thank you. And it's interesting to me as I think about that because that was an addition. We keep forgetting that that was added 30 or some years later. Um, and it was done very well because it's subservient or subordinate to the main structure. But that's now what guides the structures behind it. The 1980s edition is a little bit higher. And then you start going farther back to this proposed um, edition. And if it, it's only slightly higher at the eave level anyway, certainly the roof takes it higher than that flat roof on the uh, wing in the front. Um, but then you have to deal with all this uh, massive building uh, material, uh, building effect from the, from the materials as well. Um, I don't know, I haven't had, I'm not an architect, I haven't heard the architects or designers on the planning board or anyone else make any specific suggestions. So I'm a little nervous about doing this, but I'll throw it out there anyway. Um, I would suggest with the idea of looking at that wing as the, um, as the guiding height, that there be some type of step back on the second floor of the addition and then the hip roof behind it um, in order to um, have a view down Prospect Street and from all of the buildings in the immediate abutting neighborhood um, have the effect of a building that isn't quite so solid and so tall. And those are the, that's the extent of my detailed comments. Hey, Bonnie, this is Tanya. I know you're usually, the, I know you're usually the last commenter, but I think you might have forgotten me. I sure <laughs> did. I am um, so sorry. You, you may not have realized, I joined, I joined it, I joined after roll call, so um, I'm a little late. <clears throat> No, I can't um, count. I was actually counting and I counted wrong. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if there's anyone, if Don or um, anyone else is on. Don but... is not here. He had a last minute um, emergency and couldn't be here. And Alden won't be speaking because he's not eligible for this application. Got it. Okay. So um, on. I'm on. So um, I um, I appreciate, thank you to the bank um, for making some more changes. I, I know this has been a long process and I appreciate the time and effort that you've put into this. Um, I appreciate the time and effort that the Historic Commission has put into this as well and all the historic consultants. Um, and, uh, and I know that that we are coming up on a year on this and it's a lot of work. Um, I think that um, they have reduced the size. As I've said before, um, when I look at, at massing and scale in a lot of ways, I, you know, I, I will defer to the zoning ordinance and, and this is below um, the dimensional controls for this this zone. This zone is also a business zone. So while it does abut a residential zone, it is, it is still a business zone and they can't actually do residential here. So I think that the, the bank um, is sort of caught in that, in that conundrum um, in that they have this, this land, um, they need to expand, they need to add parking. And, and, I, and I think that from an economic development standpoint, I think it's, it's good for the downtown and it meets those zoning codes. And I just wanna make that clear. Um, I think that I, I like this architectural style better. As I've said before, I wasn't a fan of the fake residential. Um, I think that there does needs to be some work on the architectural design. Um, I think that I'd like to see some different windows. Um, I agree with um, 
Leah's comments about the first floor. Um, I agree with breaking up some of the, um, the Prospect Street facade. Um, I think that some of the landscaping on Prospect Street also could maybe, it's, it, it just makes it look like a very flat front. And, um, and so maybe there's some, some breaking up of that too. So that so that, that middle piece um, maybe more looks like a, an entry as opposed to um, you know, just, a, just a, a flat row of buildings. Um, I personally like a flat roof and I know that, and, 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 and actually Bonnie, when you were talking about the addition to the historic um, structure, I was just looking at that as a flat roof that could be kind of an interesting, I'm not sure if, that, if that, that's um, gone by the wayside at this point or whether that's even something you can do, but I, I think that would be interesting. Um, but that being said, I think um, as a board, we need to d decide you know, dimensionally and, and philosophically, are we okay with this before we start getting, I think, into the nitty gritty, the architectural details? Um, because I really don't want the bank to have to go back and spend more time and money on this if, um, if we're not okay with that. Um, and then the last thing, you know, I, I think the, the um, Secretary of Interior Standards is, is they're, they're subjective, I think in some ways, I think, you know, we can say we can, we get it, we clearly have um, two different historic consultants who, who see them one way from the Historic Commission. And I think that if we are hung up on that, I mean, we always, I guess we could get another opinion um, if, if we think that would help. I, I am not hearing that from the board, but, um, but I just wanted to throw that out there if we think that might help as a sort of a peer review. Um, but that's all I have. Um, let me ask you for clarification. You were saying that there's some big picture decision we should make before we send them back on details um, that would finalize the design. Could you mm -hmm. be a little clearer about that so we could have a little discussion? Are we, about I mean, I would, I would say just, I mean, are we okay with the, with, I guess, the scale and the massing on this? Are we okay with this, this design or this um, sort of footprint? Um, and so, I mean, before we send them back and say, hey, we'd like to change the windows or we'd like to change the lentils or we'd like to change this, then I think that we, we or the garage door, you know, I think that that we need to say, are we in some way, I know we're not approving it, but are we okay in theory, I guess, with with sort of where it's where it's located and, and how it functions at this point? I think that's a really good question. I think we ought to go around again and speak just to the, you know, if we could work with the, if we could ask them to work with the details to alleviate some of the visual problems we have with it, would we be okay with the basic footprint, height, and mass of it. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, so at, as, a, as an envelope or a shell, I don't, I'm not, may not be, again, terminology is not my strong point, but the whole sort of outer package of it, if, you, if we could live with that and, and with the idea that details would um, lead to more visual um, accommodation to our other concerns, um, could we agree to? Could we agree to then send them back for those kind of details? I think I could, but I want to hear from everyone else. I, I, I will say that um, that I, I am willing to work with this um, with this footprint and this general general layout. But I, I want to go on the record as saying that um, I agree with Rick. I, I think this should have been, it, we, it would have been really great if the bank had considered putting this right up on State Street. But you can live with the, I mean, you if it's going to stay here. I can work with it. Yeah. OK. Bonnie, are you asking whether we're whether we like the size, height, and massing, and the only the only problem is the architectural detail? Well, right. the only problem is. Oh, well, that's not the question I was saying yes to. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I, I'm saying that the the dimensions we can live with the dimensions, but the architectural details are not just cosmetic. They would actually be required to make it work because it is this tall and this big. Right, right, but the question, I guess my question, by dimensions, do you mean length, width, height? Yes. 
Okay, well, let me just let me just clarify what I said then. Um, I, I'm saying that I'm willing to work with this location, the general form, um, but but I'm assuming that dimensions are still tweakable, um, and and that the architecture is still um, there's still room for improvement with the architecture. Yeah, and to clarify, Rick, what I was saying is I, I just. We've got, we, we've, we've, the bank has gone back like three different times. I think we talked about this at the end of the last meeting. And I think we, if, before we start sending that, if we sent them back for another iteration, I think we can't then send them back and say, well, actually we just really didn't like this at all. And, and I think, um, I just, I guess that's, that's more what I'm, what I'm getting at. So to use Leah's term on top of that, can, can you work with what's there? With, with relatively minor changes, or am I jumping the gun on that? Well, I, I would qualify it by saying relatively minor because- <laughs> Yeah, you don't like that, okay. I don't like I that. Still... With what's there. We can work with what's there, um, but to Tanya's point, and to many people who feel like this year has just gone on much longer than a year for more reasons than one, but certainly for this application, um, we have to be very clear what we're asking if we ask for another iteration. And it's gotta be possible for them to pre present something to us that we could actually vote on and approve if they met our criteria. So that's how we're coming down to the line. This is it. There's gonna be one more, there could be one more uh, iteration depending on whether or not the bank is willing to go along with it. Um, and they've been very patient tonight and let us have this conversation and all the other ones. So I wanna make sure that they know our thoughts as clearly as possible before they, are, um, they respond to it. So that's where I'm heading. I, I still think the massing and the size is too large. So what would make a difference for you, Anne? I... <clears throat> You know, I don't know if there is a possible solution to the problem here. I, I, I do think, first of all, to make it um, subordinate to the original building, I think that's very difficult in terms of size and massing. Um, Let's just say I think they shrunk it 15% from the last iteration. That was great. I don't know programmatically how much further they could go. I, I the more I think about it, the more I come, come down to Rick's thought and gee, I wish we had early on seen a sketch on, on State Street. Um, it's just a lot to, to put into that neighborhood. So okay. all I'm saying is I, 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 <clears throat> I'm not saying tweak the architecture and come back. I still think massing is, is an issue for me and okay. for the neighborhood and for the context. And for the building's location on that site. Okay. You've been clear, thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and speak. I, I guess that's why I started with in my comments before is I just feel like they're trying to fit too much program into, I don't wanna say the overall lot because I think Rick is correct. There's room on this lot and it's just sad to see parking from State Street, this flat lot that exists um, behind the, the clock. Um, that's not a very friendly thing to look at, um, but nor is this large building in the back in the neighborhood and the garage door. And I guess I just do feel like they're trying to do too much. Um, I think Tanya's correct. We need to tell them <laughs> tonight instead of saying, go back and tweak things that whether this placement and this size works. And I guess I feel strongly that it doesn't. 
and I, I wish we could also refer back to, sorry, this wasn't brought up earlier, but um, I feel like the best letter that was submitted was by um, Patricia Pecknick. And there, there's so many points she brings up. And I just think um, we are, as a board, um, supposed to be looking at these standards and the ordinance. And I feel like um, it's clear from her letter that we're not following it if we let this go forward at this size. Okay. Anyone else want to chime in at this second round? I mean, I think this probably was clear from my earlier comments, but I tend to agree with Ann and MJ. Um, you know, I I have concerns about the size and the massing, um, and yes, you know, concerns about the points raised by the historical commission. Um, I would like to see, you know, some another some sort of attempt to get this to some sort of size and scale that is more compatible with the neighborhood and is um, doesn't overwhelm the historic building, which I feel is something this size does. We ready to hear from the applicant? Anyone else want to add anything before we do that? All right, um, then let's uh, head back to um, the applicant's team for your responses, please. Uh, Madam Chair, this is uh, Lisa Mead. Um, you know, I, I don't really know where to start um, except for to remind the board that, um, you know, I, I think I hearken back on Rick's comment rather about fitting this commercial project into a neighborhood. Well, this isn't a neighborhood. This is the commercial district in which residential structures are not permitted that happen to be here on part of it. And then we have a zoning change and our zoning by ordinance has hard stops at the end of the district. And that's the way it's been created. We have commercial districts that directly abut residential districts. What we're trying to construct here is a commercial use that is allowed by right within the commercial district, which happens to abut residential districts. And as some uh, another member pointed out, then in fact there, are, in fact I think it was Rick, there are many areas in town where the commercial district brick buildings um, butt up against and are adjacent to uh, wood clabbered houses, residential, smaller residential structures. Um, that is not an unusual land use pattern in the city of Newburyport. Secondly, um, I really wanna point out because I think it's been lost in all of the conversations beginning with uh, Mr. Richard's comments and the historic commission's review and sketches that they showed to the board. Um, the reason we are here is because the DOD considers the 1980 addition to the building as part of the historic structure. And therefore we are quote, altering the historic structure. And so you can't just pretend that the 1980s addition doesn't exist. It exists, we're adding on to it. It's not, we're not, it's not becoming part of this with the historic building. The massing of the 1980s structure exists. And under the DOD, as a result of that, we are altering the historic structure. And so you, you can't conveniently forget it when the whole reason that we're here is because we have to attach to the 1980s building. So I think that's really important and it's been lost. The current site does not only exist because of the original historic structure. That site includes the historic structure and its addition, the 1980 addition. And that's how it has to be judged. And 
with all due respect to the commission and Ms. Pecknick, but in, uh, in reference to a comment by Tanya, the, um, the Secretary of the Interior standards are general and are subjective, but there are standards and guidelines. And we've given a number of examples and our professionals have, have also examined this. Um, and particularly Mr. Young, who recently at, was asked to do it independently, that it meets the standards. And so I think you do look at it in context. You can't pick and choose which height of the building you want to compare it to. You can't pick and choose that there are parts of the building you want to include in the massing and other parts you don't. You have the building that exists on the lot. Um, I want to address a couple of things related to some of the specifics, um, not that it will matter right now, but I think it's important. Um, it will be a slate roof. I think it was a figure of speech that Christopher um, used there. It, it will be a real slate roof um, that goes to Leah's comment. Um, the reason the entrance was lost um, on Prospect Street is because we took out all the program space. The reason that you had an entry there is because you actually walked into something. Um, all that program space was removed uh, in order to reduce the size of the building. So that's, that's why it's gone. And you can see the entry now to the building exists directly across the parking lot over by the arched window of the 1980s edition. Um, I, I just wanted to give you the answer as to why it's gone um, for that reason. Um, so while I appreciate uh, the neighbor's comments, um, I think it's interesting that the uh, zoning ordinance, uh, we talk about uh, you know, health and welfare and, and how it fits uh, in with the district. Um, this plan meets all of the requirements of the zoning ordinance. Uh, it is a business district, it is a business use, it is allowed by right, it is under what the um, dimensional requirements are allowed, and as we've provided to you, we believe that it meets the Secretary of the Interior standards with regards to the, the DOD requirements. Um, I do want to address, I don't want to forget Elizabeth's comments related to the parking reduction. Um, you all might recall 363 days ago, when we had our first hearing with this board, where we originally proposed to um, have a, and it's still actually on the books, um, open a ITIF special permit, um, which would allow us to count the parking spaces at the Harris Street lot for uh, parking on this site and not provide all of the parking on the site. You might recall that at that meeting, not only were the local abutters, the seven or 10 that spoke tonight here, um, but all of the people on Harris Street, the people from the library, the people upstate street, there was a huge outcry that we not take advantage of the ITIF special permit and that we accommodate all of the parking on the property. Um, the bank would do that itself. Uh, and so the bank heard that and said, okay, fine, we'll, pay the extra money and we will take care of all of the parking on the parking lot ourselves. And ever since that time, the only people that have spoken, and I don't mean only in a dismissive point, of, uh, point but as in a cumulative point, they're spoken against the project are the peepers, people in the uh, direct neighborhood, the same seven to 10 people in the direct neighborhood. Um, I think it's disingenuous for Mr. Corrales, um, who owns these two rental properties that are two of the biggest properties on the street to say that uh, his rooms, uh, the, the, um, the, the house somehow will be colder um, with the proposed building. Um, the, the facts aren't there. We actually showed you the shadow study and there, there's no shadow that rides up the side of those buildings with this um, proposal. So um, I think that, and, and I believe that um, unlike the bank, um, none of those uh, units have sufficient parking to supply for the, the use that is in, that are in those, um, those residential structures. So the bank has made uh, great efforts. Um, it's very disheartening um, to hear that the bank is permitted to use this property. Um, there has been, a, there were originally a discussion about um, putting the building up at State Street uh, and the concern was there um, that it would 
truly diminish uh, the view coming up State Street of the 1870 building. Um, and we would just be having a different conversation, uh, but the people in the parking back in the back end of the building who really would like that lot to stay empty uh, would be happy. Um, I don't think that's the right um, thing to do for the streetscape. And I don't, it certainly doesn't meet the program needs um, of the bank. So um, at that point, I think I've addressed um, all of the questions that came up uh, and um, I'm or perplexed. We have a zoning ordinance that permits things to happen um, in a reasonable way. And um, there appears to be a failure of the um, understanding of the um, the ability for the bank to use its property, um, understanding that there are certainly limitations, but uh, the property owners rights under the zoning ordinance need to carry the same weight as the issues that the uh, neighbors raise and it's concerning. We'd request a continuance if the board um, doesn't have any more questions or comments or that Andy or Jonathan don't have anything to say. Good point. Um, <clears throat> yes. May we ask a question of our council? Yes, I was just going to ask him to weigh in. So give him something to get started on, Anne. Well, um, this is very interesting. Um, if the board were to deny the permit based on our historical commission's report that it doesn't meet the secretary's standards and the applicant has <clears throat> two other peer review reports, uh, stating that it does. What advice could you give the board regarding that issue? Uh, Madam Chair, this is uh, yes. John Eichmann. Thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any magic advice for the board on that question. Um, I think it's been made clear by the testimony tonight that uh, the standards that have been referenced uh, contain a lot of room for interpretation, as does the zoning ordinance. Um, and the fact that you have two um, experts providing testimony for the proponent indicating they believe it complies with the standards indicates that should the board deny it on the same grounds that those experts are testifying to, it, um, it will certainly be a difficult issue on appeal. Um, I wouldn't want to talk about the pluses and minuses at this point. Um, that's certainly something that should be left out of a public discussion, but I think we can safely say that um, it's a broad standard and there's going to be a difference of opinion and it would be very difficult to predict uh, the outcome of an appeal. Uh, okay, let me ask you this. Um, <clears throat> The uh, two opinions um, that the bank obtained, um, obviously the bank paid for those. So um, I wouldn't necessarily, not to disparage the integrity of any of the consultants, but um, is there anywhere else the planning board could go for an opinion on that? I mean, if, if that's part of our decision and you're saying it would be very hard to prove that on an appeal, um, should we seek uh, other advice? Well, uh, I think you certainly could, um, but I think at some point and maybe that point where at that point now, if we wouldn't reach it immediately when you sought other advice, we would be piling experts on one side versus experts on the other. I'm not sure that doing that would get you to a different point than you're at right now, which is a disagreement about how those standards are interpreted based um, upon people who have knowledge of that particular situation. Um, it can't, I don't think it would hurt, certainly, to have. Um, the board consult an expert on this um, unless of course that expert happens um, 
take a position that's um, compliant or um, is same as the uh, the applicants. But um, yeah, I it, I don't think that's a guarantee that the board is going to get to a place that makes this decision any easier. Um, I think it would just be more information that would be that would look a lot like what you have right now. Does that answer all your questions, Anne? Not really. <laughs> I mean, do you have any other questions? Oh, uh, no, I don't have any other questions. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. Uh, do other board members have any questions for um, Attorney Eichmann? I have a question. Just can we discuss this concept that this is a by right use um, under the zoning code? It's my understanding that if not for the DOD, it might be a by right. But given the overlay of the DOD, there is an additional standard and it the project needs to comply with that additional standard in, in order for us to grant the special permit. Yeah, that, that's correct. There, but there are two things going on here. Um, both are correct. Uh, the idea that um, Council for the Applicant indicated that this is a by right use indicates the commercial use of this property based on the underlying zoning classification. If I understand it, that's correct. That isn't as a as a right a by right use, um, but you're also correct that that use is subject to this additional special permit requirement because it's uh, in this particular district. The point of this district is to preserve the historic character of the district. So, by right uses um, are subject to the requirements of this district as well, meaning that. As we know, that new construction or alterations have to be compatible with existing historic buildings and structures. That's the standard for a special permit in this district. And there are several um, requirements or, I guess, criteria that go towards uh, demonstrating what it means to be compatible with existing historic buildings and structures. The primary one, primary one being the secretary standards. So it is as of right. But at the same time, the, um, if you want to have a new construction or alteration of existing construction, you have to comply with these standards. So just to not to, to maybe bring this to a little finer point here, I think it is important for the, the board in considering this application to think about when they're thinking about massing and size, which are clearly important issues here, the, the focus obviously should be on not just whether that's appropriate for this use in this neighborhood, but the focus in this for this particular special permit is whether the size and massing would be consistent with the standard here that requires them to be compatible with existing historic buildings and to maintain the historic character of the district. Um, that's similar, but not exactly the same standard as is it simply compatible with the existing neighborhood? Um, I think that's uh, the best way I can put that. Are there any other uh, planning board questions? Is there anything that we haven't asked um, that you would like to comment on, Attorney Eichmann? Um, thank you, Ms. Madam Chair. No, I don't. I don't think so. I think everybody is is well aware of the, like I said, that the difficulty of this. It's a, it's a broad, very discretionary set of standards that the board has to use. Um, that's not necessarily uncommon for special permits, but they're uh, not only do you have you know your standards in your zoning ordinance, but of course those standards reference then the secondary standards, which are their own set of general standards. So it's it's uh, at least two layers of you know discretionary, subjective, as it's been pointed out, standards that have to be considered. Um, so I think it's a difficult, it is a difficult consideration. But again, as I you know want to point out before, I think the focus again has to be in the nature of this special permit district is to preserve the historic nature of the district. 
and all standards should be looked at in that light. Okay. Uh, Andy, would you like to add anything? Uh, no, I think I would agree with everything that Jonathan's just offered. Um, but I would also just point out that while the, 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 the compatibility is a criteria here, um, that it, this project does fall fully within the business district. And so um, I think that the planning board is expected through this permit process. And um, it was a, a good question to ask, you know, what's the relationship between the use allowed by right or the underlying district uh, dimensional standards having been met, you know, fully by this proposed project? Um, and how that relates to the DOD and the need to meet some of those um, uh, standards, if you will. Um, to me, there's a balancing act that the planning board has essentially has been expected to do here, which is to balance um, the needs for um, the vitality of the downtown, uh, you know, the business district itself with the overlay of um, matching, you know, architectural character or compatibility. So to me, that's that's part of the balancing act that the planning board is expected to do here. Um, you know, otherwise you would see, you know, this this would not be a downtown district or wouldn't be it wouldn't be allowing uh, business expansions like this, that sort of thing. Um, uh, so um, it is a, perhaps a difficult task for the board. Uh, I know that the applicant has made a number of adjustments in an attempt to address the board's concerns. And uh, as you chair had mentioned earlier, I think um, given the length of time that, that uh, this application has been before the board, it, it would be helpful if um, whatever clarity could be given to the applicant as to what would um, what would make the project uh, acceptable or, or compatible. I know that there was a suggestion of the, the State Street location or a possibility of, of completely flipping uh, where the proposed product is. I know that that wasn't necessarily something that the applicant had brought uh, forward to the board. And I know that Rick had mentioned that very early on, I think in the permitting process. Um, I was not necessarily convinced that that was going to be a viable option either, seeing that that might similarly get opposition for, for various reasons uh, and the potential for conflict with the original structure more so. But, uh, but that being said, I think that the board has to make a call at some point as to um, when the applicant has, has crossed that threshold between um, you know, having a viable project and, and meeting the compatibility with the neighborhood. Uh, and ultimately speaking, as Jonathan pointed out, that's a discretionary uh, decision the board has to make based on the DOD criteria, which do make reference to the secretary's guidelines. Okay, um, board members, given what you've um, heard since you last spoke, would anyone like to add, add to your comments? Then attorney Mead, um, You've heard what you're going to hear, I think. Um, um, we'd request a, to... a continuance, Madam Chair, till yeah. um, your March 17th meeting. All right. Um, March 17. Could I have a motion to uh, continue this hearing on all of these ap uh, applications under the Institution for Savings on the agenda to uh, March 17th? So, so moved, it's Leah. Thank you, Leah. Second? Second, Rick. Rick, okay. And I'll uh, take roll call. Beth? Yes. Ann? Yes. Tanya? Yes. Leah? Yes. Rick? Yes. MJ? Yes. Bonnie, yes. And so we will see you on March 17th. Thank you everybody who's spoken tonight and um, we are done on this for now. All right, uh, planning board members, um, we have a quickie I believe with um, attorney Mead, if you can hang in a little bit longer. Or does oh, it, do you want my, my pleasure. <laughs> um, so let's move on to Evergreen Commons subdivision request for release of security. Do you want to take us through that? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so um, the board uh, received our request, and there's actually two requests. Um, I think I'm going to talk about the easiest one first. Um, so you might recall that um, the OSRD special permit on page uh, 15 
um, it's not numbered, um, requires the applicant to post a bond in the amount of $47,000 in order to cover the sidewalk and road improvements on Boyd Drive. Uh, those sidewalk and road improvements were, uh, were completed last year uh, and the um, DPW, uh, Jamie Tuckalo has signed off on them and reviewed them. And so we would like to have the board uh, release that bond um, having completed that condition. And then I'll talk about the, you want me to talk about both of them or you want to deal with that one first? Um, I'd oh, share this is Andy, could I address that? Yeah, about doing them separately? Yes, that I could. Yes. Yeah, oh, thank you. I, I think it's cleaner and simpler that way. I do agree that this is the, the simpler one, this first uh, item. We, I think we've, Caitlin and I have received pretty clear confirmation from the Department of Public Services that they're satisfied with the work uh, and the release of these, uh, this bond here. So to our knowledge, there are no remaining issues that the Department of Public Services had identified uh, um, underneath this condition. We pointed them back to <clears throat> the, the full condition, which is uh, shown on the screen here for your benefit. Um, so with that, um, we, this office has no objection to release of the bond uh, based on the feedback we've gotten from the Department of Public Services, which obviously directly would be dealing with the infrastructure um, there. All right. Um, anyone who has access to looking at that motion Please make it. Chair, um, I make the motion to approve the request for release of the financial security for Evergreen Commons in the amount of $47,000 pursuant to the upgrades to Boyd Drive condition and approved decision. Second, Ann. Thank you, Ann. Uh, Rick and then Ann. And I'll do roll call on that. Alden? Yes. Beth? Yes. Ann? Yes. Tanya? Yes. Leah? Yes. Rick? Yes. MJ? Yes. Bonnie? Yes. Okay, the second item, insurance policy during construction. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, during, uh, in the same um, decision, uh, the applicant was required to obtain an insurance policy to basically make sure that they didn't um, contaminate the wells. Uh, in addition, as you all might recall, those who were on the board at the time, that the applicant does um, annual testing of all the wells and then provide under the um, guidance of the water department expert and then provides all those results to um, the water department. So the applicant has been doing that. Uh, when we first read this condition, um, I believe that it applied to um, basically heavy work. Uh, Andy later pointed out to me that the um, <laughs> excuse me, the insurance policy is supposed to go until such time as the last house within the OSRD is built. Um, while we're pretty darn close, we're not quite there. So um, the applicant's going to withdraw this request tonight um, because it, it, the condition is not met yet. Thank you. We're done. I don't think we have to vote on you withdrawing. Oh, it's a minor kind of thing. So that's correct. I would say you are correct. No. Thank you. All right. So carry on with that and we'll see you back after, um, after I'm finished. Yeah, Thank sometime. you very much. <laughs> okay. Good night. Right. Planning board members. Um, we have, uh, I just want to deal with this correspondence quickly. It's a, a letter from a Mr. Jacob Cross about short-term rental ordinance. Um, it's on the record, you can read it. Um, but as some, if not all of you know, there has been one license, there have actually been two license committee meetings. Rick and I attended the first one last week and the second one took place while we were in this meeting. Um, that was, I guess, unavoidable on their part. They had already scheduled it and they weren't gonna change it. And we weren't major players as it's dealing with a license agreement um, the license city ordinance um, for short-term rentals. Um, they are uh, considering all aspects of the licensing um, ordinance, but also referring back to what we have in the zoning ordinance. And it may come to a point where they will want to move um, certain elements back into the zoning but um, we have left it with them that they will give us guidance. And so we are not 
guidance and parameters for what they believe should be in the zoning. And um, there's likely to be another meeting because um, of the full council, because Councillor Shand was there and she recommended that they take it to a meeting of the whole to get every all the councillors input on it before it um, comes back for um, more, um, before the license um, ordinance and potentially revised zoning ordinance comes back to them. Um, the other regulatory issue is that we're beyond the 90 days by which time the zoning ordinance should have been taken up and uh, dealt with by the city council. So it has to be, the zoning ordinance has to be re-advertised anyway. So that's another reason to leave it until we have any input, uh, specifically the planning office has input from the, from the city council on what changes they would like to see um, incorporated into the zoning um, so that that could be republished as a, an amended zoning proposal. Um, and we would discuss it at that point in a joint public hearing with the city council. If, if I've made any sense at all, um, hopefully we can just move forward and wait for city council. We can sit tight and wait for city council to come back to us. I think Rick can probably add more details on what they're thinking about moving into the zoning ordinance, um, if you'd like to, um, just so people know what the thinking is, what we might be hit with. I guess I guess the um, it really came uh, I think more from Councillor Devlin, but the um, it would, and also from concerns from from some residents that that they would like to see more specificity of where in the city um, short term rentals would be allowed as the the draft that's that we've had before us has uh, essentially allowed them as of right in all residential zoning districts subject to being licensed. Um, and uh, there was concern that that was too wide open. So there's a, a possibility, I won't say it's, it's a, uh, I'm not sure, sure that everybody on the, on the licensing committee or all city councilors agree with it, but the suggestion has been made to tighten that up somewhat and give more specificity to which areas in the city short-term rentals would be allowed. That pretty much covers it. Uh, anyone have any questions on that? I know you just want to be finished. That's fine. It's okay. Um, so we'll move on to approval of the minutes for uh, February 3rd. Do you have a motion? This is Tanya. I move to approve them. Okay. Thank you, Tanya. Second. 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 Alden. Oh, wait, I heard. Yeah, all right, Alden, thank you. Okay. Um, any significant changes from anybody that you'd like to bring up? Okay, um, I'll take a roll call on approval, for approval. Alden? Yes. Beth? Yes. Anne? Yes. Tanya? Yes. Leah? Yes. Rick? Yes. MJ? Yes. Bonnie, yes. Minutes are approved. I don't think I have anything else. Andy, anything you want to update us on from what you've been talking to the counselors about? I think. I'm sure I'll be very brief. <laughs> okay. uh, I know you've been here a while. Just a couple of things real quick. Uh, the 6C amendment that was submitted and sponsored, uh, Councilor Shan agreed to sponsor. We'll have to hold a joint hearing for that. So I'll be coordinating with uh, Chair Sontag and Chair Shan from the City Council's Planning and Development Committee about a date for that. We'll typically be uh, working with one of your regular planning board dates, just trying to make sure that it's uh, reserved for that particular subject matter. Um, because uh, Councilor Connell had agreed to sponsor a zoning change for Palm Island, 
to initiate the discussion of whether or not to curb that growth on the island. Um, I would suggest that we try to initiate those two zoning changes on the same night, just to save you all the trouble of having uh, you know extra nights of meetings or whatnot. Um, so we're we'll working together to do that. Um, I'll, I'll distribute that amendment out to you as well. Just waiting for the council packet to be finalized uh, tomorrow. Um, that would, like I said, the the idea behind that amendment uh, that you know can be discussed further and flushed out you know, in joint public hearing and committee is is that it would basically um, direct the ZBA Zoning Board of Appeals when approving modifications on the island to uh, allow modifications of houses, you know, raising structures up on stilts if need be, but not necessarily adding square footage or new bedrooms uh, or enlarging the footprints of those buildings. Um, that's the essence of that change. So that'll be coming out. And like I said, I'd suggest we try to, uh, for efficiency, just try to use one hearing night, like as we've done before for multiple amendments. If the 60 amendments are pretty straightforward and there's less debate about that, that could go forward and be adopted. If the island uh, zoning changes are still being discussed, that could just be kept uh, you know, in, in committee if need be. Um, the other thing I would mention is uh, we're gonna continue on with the uh, next council packet with the housekeeping amendments and then as we talked about earlier, is from uh, zoning rewrite elements. I'll be working with um, various different planning board members, obviously the chair and vice chair, and a few others that we've talked about in these, um, um, you know, task oriented um, work we talked about at a prior meeting, just to try to uh, pull in together any edits to the zoning ordinance in various different sections um, that, that may benefit us. So we'll, we'll be working with you and getting thoughts on that. Um, I, I would note as well two things, two other things, one real quick. The uh, city's new climate resiliency plan is being presented tomorrow night. So if you're at all interested in hearing with that uh, presentation, there's uh, some good visuals on that of the issues that we face for uh, climate change and resiliency in the report. Um, and um, so that, uh, that'll be tomorrow night at seven. Um, and the plan is posted on the website. The presentation slides will follow, but um, they'll, it's being rolled out tomorrow night with the resiliency committee and the mayor. Um, and uh, that does speak to uh, a particular concern to me as planning director for long-term planning land use issues. It does concern me the, the coastline and the Palm Island uh, development uh, issues. Uh, that's where we see most of the vulnerability in my opinion. So uh, as a land use matter. So uh, for that reason, that's why I think that this is the Palm Island piece needs to be dealt with um, sooner rather than later. Um, and it does have a correct direct tie to the long range planning and zoning. Um, the other thing I would mention is that the Citizens Planners Training Collaborative, CPTC, is once again doing trainings. Uh, they, uh, I guess, are doing on March 1st a training, one of their typical sessions that has to do with uh, writing defensible uh, decisions. So, um, well, obviously, we're staff, Caitlin and I are here to help draft those decisions. We work with Jennifer and with you board members and others to make sure that decisions are tightened up. Um, the, it's always good to kind of get a refresher for uh, board members who might be interested in that sort of thing. So I'll ask Diane, just as typical to, um, uh, we'll just start to reach out to board members, planning board, ZBA, et cetera, and just ask if anybody wants to attend that. Uh, if you're interested that evening, March 1st at uh, 6.30 p.m., um, you'd get the Zoom link or whatever and uh, and attend that if you want. It's, I think, a two-hour session. Um, but they basically go over um, the types of things that you should be looking for in a defensible decision, um, you know, writing strong defensible decisions. You know, obviously, we're here to help with doing that to make sure that you reference all the code sections like we talked about uh, earlier this evening in another hearing um, and that we have, have the right language in there and it's clear and unambiguous. Um, but that session just helps with that. So if you're all interested in attending it, um, uh, just look for that email and respond back. Diane can handle the registration for members. And I just want to piggyback on that. Anytime you go to those training sessions and something strikes you that would be really good for the rest of us to know about, please, on the updates, um, plan to tell us a little bit about it. And we could even have a conversation because um, some of us went to those years ago and don't always refer to our notes or remember what we learned back then or things could have changed. So um, it would be helpful to all of us to help the planning staff so they can help us write better decisions. Um, so anything you pick up that you think um, you've seen where we've maybe slipped up on something in particular, or you just think it's a really good thing to be reminded of, um, we'd love to hear from you. So chair. Okay, speaking of sharing, anybody have anything else relevant to the planning board that you'd like to share with us? All I wanna say is thank you for being as specific as you were um, tonight in the feedback to the Institution for Savings. That was a really productive discussion. They, it's the best we can do. They heard us 
you know, say the same thing different ways or different things once. Um, and I was encouraged that they asked for a continuance um, of their own volition. And so um, we're doing the best we can. And I think we all made that very clear. And I just am just so glad to be working with all of you. Thank you. So I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Rick. Uh, second. Second, Alden. Okay, Alden. All right. Um, Alden. Yes. Beth. Yes. Anne. Yes. Tanya. Yes. Leah. Yes. Rick. Yes. MJ. Yes. Bonnie, yes. See you, um, whatever that is, the 3rd of March, because it's the same as February was. Easy to remember. <laughs> okay, take care. Bye, all. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Rick.